Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for joining us. You are watching the Jay Dyer YouTube channel. Jay has invited me to act as co-host and moderator for tonight's debate. I'm the host of the Boiler Room live radio show, which airs on alternatecurrentradio.com every Thursday night at 8 p.m. Central. My call sign there on that show is Hesher. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Please check out Boiler Room. But the main event tonight on the Jay Dyer YouTube channel, we're about to host a discussion in debate format here between philosopher, author, TV and radio host. Uh, he's the proprietor of jaysanalysis.com. You know him as Mr. Jay Dyer. Jay, uh, welcome to the debate and uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Jay Dyer, Jay's Analysis. Uh, um, I'm the author of Esoteric Hollywood 1 and 2. My graduate work was analytical philosophy uh, and psychological warfare, particularly in terms of English lit, uh, more recently in terms of uh, Ian Fleming. So my focus is in worldviews, how worldviews work, uh, paradigms, presuppositions. And so I believe in the transcendental argument for God's existence. So I'll be uh, I'll be arguing for that. And... Uh, I have created a couple TV shows, and I do a lot of uh, comedy and film analysis. All right, excellent. Looking forward to this, Jay. And on the other side of the table tonight, uh, along with, or perhaps versus, uh, he's the president of the Atheist Community of Austin, and he hosts a show called The Atheist Debates for his lovely patrons over at patreon.com forward slash atheist debates. His name is Mr. Matt Dillahoney, Matt, go ahead and introduce yourself to the audience. Uh, pretty sure you just did. I, I'm Matt Dillahoney. I've been hosting the Atheist Experience Show for around 15 years or something. Uh, I was president for seven years, then I wasn't. Now I am again. Um, I do lectures, debates, and magic shows. And I completely forgot because in that closet back there is this massive stack of DVDs, including my Dario Argento collection, which I was going to have where you could. But it would be a distraction. We can talk about that one another time. All right. I did an analysis of Suspiria. It's funny you said that. It's yeah. It's actually not my favorite, but I understand it's probably his most popular. And uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's probably my favorite. But go ahead. All right. Excellent. All right. Well, looking forward to it. Okay. As far as the show format goes, uh, Jay, go ahead and jump in if I don't have anything right here. But it looks like we're going to do ten minute segments, and uh, I'll give you fellas a thirty second warning before a segment ends. Um, so those will be, uh, are those uninter uninterrupted segments, Jay? Is that how we're going to work this? Yeah, yeah, 10-minute uninterrupted segments. Okay. And then for the first hour, and then if Matt, Matt wants to do a crossfire or whatever, conversation style, we can. Okay, great. So perhaps a crossfire round in the second hour if we're going to go that far. And uh, I believe we will be taking a Super Chat Q&A at the end of the show. So... Uh, fellas, help me uh, make sure I know like a few minutes before everybody, anyone has to leave or anything like that so we can be sure and get that in there. And uh, okay, I guess uh, that's it. So uh, Matt, I think we'll uh, we'll give it to you. Do you want to go first or do you want to go second? Oh, I, I guess I'll go second because I'm not the one that's presenting an argument for something. So it's more of a response thing. And and the whole thing, you know, 10 interrupted minutes. I, I don't even know if I'll end up using that because I'm much more interested in the back and forth, but we'll work it however you need to. Okay, okay yeah, great. I just did that to be safe. So whatever. I didn't know what, what how we want to do it. All right, uh, I'll go. I'll go ahead and say that. Um, so basically my argument will be presented like this. I think that um, worldviews are what we all have. We all function on the basis of three basic uh, philosophic approaches to life that are usually boiled down to metaphysics, ethics, and epistemology. So this, these three branches of philosophy historically have been what makes it what we could, what we could call a worldview, at least in, in Western philosophy. I would say that um, I believe, and I would argue, that each one of these branches is intertwined with the other. So for example, if I argue for something in the realm of epistemology, uh, if I argue that a belief is true, Typically, what goes along with that is also an assumption about ethics and moral claims, moral judgments, that one ought to follow what is true. Um, now, one could disagree with that conceivably, but I'm going to argue that I think they're all intertwined. Similarly, if I were to say that uh, we know that something is the case, it also tends to uh, imply or necessitate certain beliefs about metaphysics, claims about what's real, what's not real. Uh, what can be or what can't be. So these three aspects of a worldview, I would say, are in a sense transcendental categories, or they at least 
utilize a lot of transcendental categories. Transcendental categories would be things like the principle of induction, the laws of logic, the past, identity over time, the self, um, the, the regularity that we find in nature. These are not uh, subjects that are the immediate purview of empirical sense data or empirical science. They're related to empirical science. For example, the principle of induction, that the future will be like the past, that there's regularity in logic, that there's regularity and that there's a flow, you could say, to the scientific method. For example, if you study philosophy of science, you'll know that there's actually a logical process that's assumed in the process of doing the scientific method. So from reasoning on the basis of hypothesis to what the data supports towards a conclusion, for example, it presupposes that one ought to be true in this process if one wants to uh, obtain the most true uh, 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 conclusions in this in this process. It presupposes the logic that one, um, process, one step in this process should follow another step. And it also presupposes all kinds of other things like the words have meaning, regularity, et cetera, that objects have a sort of uniformity to them over time. That's, I would say, is all presupposed in the scientific process itself. Numbers would be presupposed in this process. And, and these are all, I think, things that are immaterial, invariant, they're conceptual, and they're abstract. Now, I think that because something is presupposed in the scientific methodology doesn't necessarily mean that we, in other words, what I'm saying, we don't necessarily prove everything in the same way, right? So in other words, something that is assumed, it's a category like that, a law of logic or something that's utilized in the scientific method is in a way more properly basic, more fundamental than even the scientific method itself. So even though the scientific method is not, doesn't have the laws of logic under its immediate purview, it still assumes laws of logic and that regularity that cannot be proven in terms of empirical sense data. So if one were to adopt a kind of naive empiricist view, a kind of logical positivism, what we end up with is the inability to understand or to justify the belief in the principle of induction, the regularity of nature, that the future will be like the past. Now, one could say conceivably that they don't think that we have to justify it or that we can't justify it. But I think that at that point we would be being arbitrary and we would be believing in and admitting things that we don't have any sort of uh, justification for. And I'm speaking here of a kind of specific philosophic justification here uh, in terms of warranted beliefs, in terms of uh, justifying true beliefs, et cetera. The, the, the way history of philosophy in the West has typically justified uh, propositions and beliefs. I would say that we would be relying on things that are immaterial that we can't justify. And so the way that I move from that to God is to say that there are actually a whole bunch of things in all of our lives that we assume that are not strictly speaking physical, not strictly speaking, quote, pragmatic, because I, from what I gather from Matt's worldview, he tends to have a very sort of pragmatic approach. Uh, there's all these types of things that are not immediately justified or known by sense data or basic empiricism or in what's in the history of philosophy called naive empiricism. So what I would say is that if I were Matt, I, if I wanted to be a consistent skeptic, I would go the route of David Hume and be a skeptic all the way. And to be a skeptic all the way would be to admit ultimately that no, there's not a justification for induction for the regularity that we see in nature. And thus there's no justification epistemically, logically in terms of rationality, reason, logic, et cetera, for the scientific method itself. Now we can fast forward all the way up to modern logicians like Bertrand Russell or William uh, Van Orman Quine. Russell and Quine also continued this idea of saying that there's not really a justification if you're a basic empiricist for these ideas. Uh, uh, they just have to be kind of a given. We can treat them like they are, but we can't coherently give a basis or justification for them. So to me, that's kind of an admission of the intellectual bankruptcy of this kind of logical positivist position. So you have all these kinds of things that are different from just physical material, physicalism, like laws of logic, like numbers, like number theory, like Mandelbrot sets, right? Very, very elaborate mathematical sort of equations that, that many philosophers and mathematicians, somebody like Roger Penrose, and I'm just bringing this forth as a testament, not a proof, just as a, a, an expert testament. You know, Penrose says that when I looked into the advanced mathematics of Penrose tiling, he said it looked to me like we're actually discovering 
these mathematical principles, not socially constructing them. So if you know about fractals, you know about Mandelbrot sets, you know they're very elaborate, right? They're not something that, that could just be a social construct. They're actual mental discoveries. So the point is that if that's the case, then I don't think it's at all irrational to believe that all of these different kinds of categories or transcendental preconditions could be explained perfectly in a worldview where God exists, and particularly the Christian view. So I'm here to defend Orthodox Christianity, not Southern Baptist theology, not the fundamentalist stuff, not Roman Catholicism or any of the other views. I have a very specific view and argument from Orthodox Christology and theology. Uh, so when we have that conception of God, God as a divine mind, uh, omnipotent, omnipresent, et cetera, et cetera, what we then see is that reality has its grounding and its basis in the mind of God. So quite literally, everything that exists has a logoi or a logi, an exemplar, as it's called in the West. This is kind of like Platonism, but I want to be very precise because we're not Platonists. But we do believe that the essences and the universals that exist are ultimately grounded in the mind of God. And that makes perfect sense. That makes sense why there's regularity in nature because of divine, divine providence, because everything that exists is, in a sense, grounded in the mind of God. Thus, truth has more than just a pragmatic function. It actually is a transcendent quality. Truth is actually objective. It's not just a social construct. It's actually a reflection of the mind of God. And specifically, I would argue that if we got into the nitty gritty of it, it would be a defense of the orthodox view of God, right? Getting down to the point of the one and the many. For example, this is a classic problem in, in the history of Western philosophy. The one and the many problem is solved by our doctrine of the Trinity and more specifically by the Logos, Christ, and the Logi, right? The rational principles that are operant in nature. Now, it's true that we could remove all that. We could just say, well, none of that's true. I don't buy any of that. Those are a bunch of logical crazy leaps. And I just think that what exists out there is matter in motion. And I know Matt's heard this argument many times. I'm not going to rehash all the sort of classic uh, uh, presuppositionalists, quote unquote, that he's debated, because I think my argument is a little more precise, uh, a little more fleshed out, uh, better argued, hopefully, uh, and that is that all of these different transcendental categories, if you were to sort of bundle them into a big pile, they make perfect sense in a world created by God, in a world that unfortunately is fallen, uh, but nevertheless still reflects to a degree the truth about God. If we're made in the image of God, we understand how there's dignity. If we are made in the image of God, we have the ability to know objective truth, right? God's world is regular. It operates on principles of regularity. If the mind of God is the basis of all reality, we have a basis for these really abstract and, and obtuse mathematical principles that we know are real, that are not, strictly speaking, physical. So all of these kinds of things, right, ethics, epistemology, metaphysics, they make perfect sense in a worldview where our God exists and the kind of God that we argue for. In a worldview where we have pure materialism, pure pragmatism, random chance, random chaos, there's nothing like invariant, immaterial, uh, conceptual law-like things. Where are they? What are they? They're just social constructs. Now, I don't know if that's Matt's opinion or view, but I have heard him say in previous discussions and talks that he doesn't think that there is a justification, so to speak, for logical laws, mathematical principles, these sort of abstract conceptual things. He thinks that they're just kind of things that we just use and they work. 30 seconds. But that, but that would be, I would say, to be arbitrary. Uh, and when it comes to debate, we're presupposing universal categories and laws, and that doesn't allow us to be arbitrary. All right. Thank you, Jay. Uh, excellent. Well done. It was right on time. And uh, over to Matt now. Let me reset our timer here. Okay, Matt, over to you. Hi. Uh, yeah, so first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, I will say... I'm not convinced that I actually heard an argument in all of that. Um, one of the things is is that yeah, I'm not necessarily requiring that we have you know a fully constructed syllogism, but if we could get close to that, because what you seem to be arguing for in this is, hey, we all have a worldview, and it includes all these things, and they're intertwined. I, I, I agree. Um, but what I'm getting to is to whether or not the things in our worldview are true. I mean, there probably needs to be a side discussion about truth and whether or not we can actually, whether or not we can attain it. Because when you say that it's essentially arbitrary uh, to decide that we can't justify the things that we presuppose, 
Uh, I, I disagree. When we have, for example, the, the laws of logic, which I would argue presupposes truth or presupposes reality. And so there's a number of things that we're going to presuppose uh, just to get work done. And, but they're not, it's not just arbitrary. It's not like we decided, oh, a thing is what it isn't, and we'll just arbitrarily accept that. There are reasons why we have justification to think that that's reasonable. But the recognition that we don't necessarily know what guarantees that is not arbitrary. It's an acknowledgement that throughout all of, of, of the time that we've been kind of pouring over these things in philosophical contexts, uh, we haven't been able to come up with something that is demonstrably a guarantor of logic or a guarantor of human dignity or any of the things that that you might list. And so it's completely unsurprising to me that, and, and I think it's true, a worldview that includes a belief in a God that could serve as a guarantor for all of those things makes the world make sense. But that's about a belief in a God that does that. And you, you can substitute the word God with anything. Belief that there is a justifiable foundation serves as a justifiable foundation. It's virtually circular there. The The problem here is that you're assuming that in fact there is some sort of foundation. And I don't know if you're doing it in, in, a, in a sort of causal sense, which I would argue might be a mistake because causality primarily I think would deal with like physical physicality and, and causality may not apply to the abstract, uh, at least not without there being some physical thing like a, you know, you, you have an abstract thought, you convey it to me and that leads to this, but that's still a physical process of what's happening in the brain and that there may not be causality with regard to the abstract. And so when I, when I look at things like truth, um, yeah, I'm fine with the, you know, truth is that which comports with reality, but I don't see any path to absolute certainty. I don't see any way to, uh, guarantee um, or, or, or point to something that says this guarantees that identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle uh, are always universally correct. They appear to be. They, they are, Our reliance on them is because they continually demonstrate their reliability in the sense that we're not all dead. Uh, if, if, I, if I have a worldview that says that buses are imaginary, all of a sudden becomes crossing the street becomes far more dangerous. And so the only thing that I can do is interact with the reality that I have. And so I'm I'm a big proponent of Occam's razor, don't multiply entities unnecessarily. And so I presuppose that there's a reality which I share, um, which I can't prove or justify. Uh, I do find, I think there are some, some potential arguments against hard solipsism, uh, but only in the sense that uh, they seem satisfying to us. There's it's no way to demonstrate it. Like the, the one I've used before is that I find it patently absurd that I've both written every wonderful song that I've enjoyed, which I don't understand and don't know the key of or anything else, but, uh, and also the ones that I despise, or I've been every caller who's called into the show with good points and all the callers that have called in with bad points. That, that level of, I am the only thing, uh, I think perhaps intuitively, if, if no other justification appears to be far more absurd than the likelihood that Jay and I are sharing a reality. And so when I, when I look through the opening here, I agree we have a worldview. Um, I noticed that among the abstract transitory items, he didn't list truth. Um, whether or not it's in there on, on his view is up to him. But, oh, <laughs> there was a note popped up there. Um, but so when it was interesting because when Jay said, here's how I get from there to God, and we'd gone through a long list of things, and it's here's how I get from there to God. And then we heard about Russell and Quine and just on and on and on about how, uh, and, and some items about mathematics. And the only thing that came close to how we get to a God, as far as I can tell, is uh, sort of, um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna remember the, the right term, but essentially, it's an, it's, it was an expression that a worldview without a God leaves us without answers to this, but a worldview with a God gives us answers to this. And that presupposes that the type of answers that you're getting from a God are actually answers, that, th that there is some explanation. The questions that, that, that I would have is, uh, I, tons of them, which we'll get to at different points throughout this, but is it possible for something to just be the way it is, that something X is true without some sort of external justification, guarantor, or 
prescriber. Because if if that's the case, and and there is a whole bunch in philosophy about what truth is and whether or not it's accessible. And you know, if I'd have known we were going to spend as much time as we likely are today, I probably would have gotten high beforehand because that that makes those conversations at least a little more fun. Except that I don't like to be high, and certainly not in in a debate. But the 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 question about truth, you could argue, for example. Let's, let's take identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle, which I used to say was the only thing that I presuppose. And then I realized, no, I have to presuppose truth in order to be able to presuppose those. The problem is, is that there's a little loop there automatically, which is if I want to justify that there is truth, that there is a reality, if, if I'm using a compatibilist model of truth, um, I still have to exercise reason to reach that conclusion. So we're back to us, the essentials of identity, non-contradiction, et cetera. And so when we talk about whether or not something is true, we qu quite often it is, there must be some explanation for this because we run around the world and we see things and we, we look at it and say, why is that the way it is? And I've, I've said before that you know, people would argue that, well, science offers how questions, not why questions. But that's that's semantics, because I can reword any question we have as a how or a why. How did this come to be is essentially the same as why does this exist as long as you're you're being contextual. And so this and this admission that I don't have an explanation for why there is truth or is there truth or why are the logical laws uh, apparently absolute and inviolable, isn't an admission of intellectual bankruptcy. It is an admission of what appears to be the, the facts of the case, which is why, you know, you've got the transcendental arguments for the existence of God, which I would argue, uh, and, and you might have other arguments. I mean, Plantic is modologic, ontological, et cetera. And these are kind of held up amongst incredibly smart and well-read people as some of the best arguments for the existence of God. And uh, that may or may not be the case. I'm, I'm, I've been asked many times, what, what's the best argument for God? And I don't know. Uh, but the, that they're being held up as this seems to be based on an, on an idea that there is, in fact, an explanation. And I have seen no argument or evidence that, that there is, in fact, that sort of an explanation. And so while you can phrase it as I'm admitting intellectual bankruptcy, um, I prefer to view it as being intellectually honest that I'm not going to make more presuppositions than necessary. I'm not going to say, you know what, it'd be really nice if there was something that could serve as a foundation for logic. And it would also be really nice if there was something that could serve as a foundation for morality. It would also be something very nice if there could serve as a foundation for uh, human dignity, et cetera. Um, that'd be really cool, except that I don't know that there are foundations for those. I don't know that it's impossible that they couldn't just, well, first of all, they may not all be true, uh, but I don't see that it's impossible. There's been no demonstration that there must be some foundation beyond the laws of logic. And, and the curious thing is, I think that even if you argued that a God solves that problem, the only reason that it does is because modern theological definitions of God include this thing that God doesn't need a justification. As 30 just a, seconds, Matt. It's a bald assertion. So we have these things that may or may not have a justification. We're not aware of what that justification would be. And then we argue for something that hypothetically could serve as that justification. And maybe even just believing it exists serves as a satisfier, but not a guarantor. And in spite of that, we're stuck with how did we come up with this thing that serves as an explanation for nothing and needs no explanation of itself. Okay. Time's up. Good one. Good one. All right. Um, yeah. Great comments there and questions from Matt. Um, so first he asked for a syllogism. So I, I think I can oblige this to a degree and say that, uh, yeah, uh, 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 I could state it like this. There are many transcendental categories. I'll list some of the ones that I think are, are strong. And I don't mind that Matt included the, the idea of truth. I don't have a problem including truth. There's, pr there's plenty, actually. It's just that I was just kind of going off sure. the top of my head and listing some. But you could say something like identity of objects over time. You could say value judgments. You could say uh, interpretive frameworks. You could say the problem of the one and the many. You could say meaning in language. You could say words themselves. You could say 
temp, uh, temporal spatial relations. You could say the past. You could say numbers. You could say the idea of causality. You could say the, uh, the idea of telos, rights, freedom. Um, all of these could be bundled together. Uh, if we were to uh, uh, discuss those things, um, they're presupposed not just in the process of scientific methodology, which I was kind of focusing on in the opening statement, but in life in general, right? I mean, throughout life, we assume these kinds of things all throughout. We assume the existence of a self, right? The self, however, is not something, obviously, that is empirically verifiable. We, we kind of assume it in the process of arguing for it or against it. Uh, now, I'm not saying that that people that argue about it or, or that, that there might not be in, you know, some attempt to scientifically investigate the notion of a self. But even if you were to find a pineal gland where you thought something you know, like Descartes, where, where the soul or the self or mind or whatever was housed or whatever, there's still a, disti a distinction, I would argue, between brain and mind, in my view. Now, that's why I'm saying that when we talk about reasoning, when we talk about logic, when we talk about all these different categories, I think we're talking about things that are outside the purview of mere sense data and sense experience. That doesn't mean that they don't have any connection to material sense data and sense experience. They're, they're interrelated, but they're not identical. So I, I want to say that I don't think we have to fall into like an either or unless we presuppose materialism. I think if we did presuppose materialism, it would be self-contradictory. So the argument specifically in terms of syllogism is that all of these transcendental categories, if they are to be made coherent and sensible, and I do believe in a coherentist view of truth and justifying claims, not a, a classical foundationalist type of view in terms of epistemology. So I'm going to be arguing for that school of thought. I would say that, that we would justify them in terms of their coherence in the worldview in which there is a God that's that's presented according to Orthodox Christianity. So that's the syllogism, if you want a, a boiled down version of it. And, and that's a positive statement of the argument that he's justified on the basis of being the grounds and the coherence, if you will, what strings all these many pearls of transcendentals together on a golden string, if you will, a pearl necklace, is God himself. God is the personal one who does this, and because he's personal and not an immaterial abstract force like uh, a law of logic or gravity or the way the Greeks thought of God as thought thinking itself or some impersonal force, he's actually personal, that then makes reality at a fundamental level personal and not dead matter. It's not meaningless matter out there. It's actually uh, fundamentally uh, at the very fabric and structure uh, at subatomic level, I would argue, a personal God that's there, that's present, that's staring us at the fa in the face in every action of predication and every act in the world, even in the midst of evil actions. If we if we think about the problem of evil, I would argue that that presupposes some standard by which we judge good and evil. Now, Matt's response was that, um, can we even attain to this truth? Uh, he's not convinced that we can. And so he went on to sort of explicate that, as, as I wrote down what he was saying, I don't want to misrepresent him, that that just because we believe that we sort of constructed justifications for things in an abstract way doesn't necessarily mean that it perhaps matches up to the external world. Maybe that, that we just believe that we've attained justifications, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is, right? So we can't move to this, this abstracted realm into the realm of the here and the now out there in the world. Um, I could, to a degree, concede that, except that I don't think that that's what my argument was or was intended to be. I wasn't trying to argue that um, just because we can find a rational justification that it necessarily means that everything in the world conforms to a, a purely mental structure, because I'm not just trying to map the external world with mathematics or something like that. I'm actually looking at something that's even more fundamental, in my view, than numbers or mathematics. I would argue that in our system, yes, God is the ultimate presupposition. So Matt was correct to say that it sounds like Jay's presupposing the existence of God, and yes, I am. And I know that Matt's debated presuppositions before. I don't think they were very good presenters of that argument. But yes, in effect, because I believe in that sort of coherentist view of truth and of the world, it's impossible for me not to have some final circular authority that I appeal to. In my belief, in my in my system, my worldview, it is ultimately going to be God. And that's not inconsistent with the system or the or the the philosophy that I'm promoting, right? Coherentism, uh, not classical foundationalism, which out of the Enlightenment actually leads to that kind of atheist materialist perspective, I would say. But in fact, there's nothing logically wrong or or incoherent by saying that God is the ultimate foundation in my worldview and that I am presupposing it and that I'm comparing what I presuppose to Matt's presuppositions. Matt's presuppositions are very pragmatic, as I said. They're very they're skeptical and they're pragmatic. And I I understand that. I don't necessarily have a problem with it. I would just 
enjoin Matt to be more consistent if he's going to go that route and go the route of Hume and go ahead and say that truth can't be justified. Induction can't be justified. And not only can it not be justified, we have to utilize all these things that don't make sense on our worldview. So I wasn't just throwing out names of Russell and William Ben Oren Quine of to be fancy or whatever, but I'm actually making a specific point about the fact that Russell and Quine, all the way back to Hume, there's been a consistent pattern amongst the empiricists, the pragmatic tradition, to say there's not a rational, logical justification for these things that we use in an empiricist worldview. And if there's not, then, then we don't really have a reason or a basis to go into debate. I'm not saying that you can't debate. I'm glad that you did. But on the grounds of logic, on the grounds of debate, which I think presupposes logic and truth, as you talked about, we don't really have the grounds to debate itself, right? So debate presupposes some common notion of truth. It presupposes the ability to communicate truths that are not merely material. I mean, I'm speaking words that have meaning, right, that are conceptual in some way, that go beyond just the vocal cords and just the electricity that actually convey information. If we look at information science, information science t suggests that there's, we don't find information, meaningful information being transferred anywhere in the world that's not from a mind. So the argument that I made was that even more fundamental than numbers or, or the concept of information or, or words is all of these transcendental categories that are presupposed in communication, in life, in logic, in ethics, and whatever. And they make sense in a paradigm, in a complete worldview where we have the kind of God that we believe in. That is the argument. Now, one could conceivably say, I don't accept transcendental arguments. I don't believe that they're a valid form of logic. Well, one could do that, but I think that that would lead to, again, more fundamental self-contradictory positions that are ultimately sort of destructive to philosophy as a whole. I mean, I, I kind of appreciate that Matt was almost hinting maybe that, well, maybe there could be some sort of solipsism or something like that. And I think that if one were to go down the logical positivist Humean route, that would be the consistent way to go. You would kind of be led to that, uh, whoa, you know, we live in the matrix kind of view, like Neo or something, right? That, that this is just sort of a, a projection of my subconscious, of my mind, because many in the empiricist tradition actually did go down that way. They went down that route by saying that, you know, if we're going to talk about justifying our beliefs, being rational, giving a coherent account of our beliefs, we can't really prove the existence of the past. Not only can we not do that, we can't justify induction, the, pr the, the principal belief that the future will be like the past. We can't really justify the self. I mean, we have a maybe a bundle of memories, but that doesn't necessarily equate to a, quote, self, that there's a transcendental unity of a self that that sort of is uh, underlying all these perceptions, right? All these, these uh, the sense data that comes to us from our, our uh, from empirical experiences. Um, we, if we can't justify those things, then some of them went in this route of a kind of radical solipsism. And they said, yeah, the only thing that we can know is what's immediately presented to our senses. And even that, we can't even know if that's coming to us from an external world. Uh, it's just perhaps something that our mind is presenting to our senses, right? Um, this would be eventually the debate that's called indirect realism. And, and if you go the route of indirect realism, then you don't even have a basis for an external world. And Belief in the external world actually is a transcendental category, a transcendental truth, I would argue, as all these other things that I listed are. Now, if we're at that point in our philosophy, and I don't fault Matt for going perhaps into and exploring the realms of where these ideas lead, I think what they show us is that when we don't have the presupposition of God and when we don't start with that, we're inevitably led down these paths to dead ends in philosophy, total contradictions. And for example, if one were to say, well, maybe solipsism isn't a contradiction. Maybe everything is just a phenomena of my mind. If we were to go to that route, then we would be led to the conclusion that everything that's, everything that's happening is essentially in some sense illusory or just a figment, a phenomena of, of passing ghost, you could say. Uh, and if that was the case, then my coming to know the truth of solipsism would also be part of the solipsist maze and mirror, and it would be self-contradictory. All right, and time. Thank you, Jay. Very good, very good. Everybody, if you're just joining us, you're at the Jay Dyer YouTube channel, and we're having a friendly discussion slash debate tonight between Jay Dyer and Matt Dillahunty. I am your uh, co-host, your guest host, your moderator, your timekeeper. My call sign is Hesher. Thank you for joining us for the show tonight. And uh, all right, Matt, we'll pass it back over to you. Uh, the mic is yours. Yeah, so uh, I'm a huge fan of Hume. Um, 
doesn't mean I agree with him everything. I'm definitely not a logical positivist, but I think Hume on the foundations of epistemology is probably where most of my views either formed or began. And and for a longest time, and, and I don't really go with labels when we talk about a lot of things. Like I, I'm fine with truth is that which comports to reality largely, as opposed to a coherence view of truth. When it comes to the foundations, I think probably one of my favorite ones that comes closest to being a label that I could apply to myself is actually found here in Tism, which is something that Susan Hawk put forth, um, I don't know, somewhere in the last 20 years or so, maybe. Uh, it's a combination of foundationalism and coherentism. Uh, and and yet none of it actually works because I don't think we've completely cracked the problem or we it would be ridiculous of us to pretend that we uh, are all in agreement on uh, the best epistemology. As a matter of fact, I'm in an argument or about to be in an argument with somebody else who argued for intuition as an epistemology, and I find that patently absurd, especially when you say, oh, yeah, intuition's an epistemology, but you can't really trust it. You have to go and test it. And that means that testing is now your epistemology and intuition is, is the process by which you apply the results. Um, but to say that my view means I have no grounds to debate because, you know, we don't have a common ground. We do have a common ground. Uh, we, we are, in fact, doing it. We're debating concepts beyond what we already agree with. Uh, as far as I can tell, Jay and I agree that we share a reality. Whether or not we can justify that is independent of the fact that we agree that we do. We, we seem to share the notion that identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle uh, are as absolute as anything I can imagine. Um, we begin with that common ground, and then we debate the things that aren't common. And one of those things is, is there a foundation behind this? Is there some justification for thinking there's a foundation? Or is this circular appeal to the God presupposition that Jay talked about, is that really something that we use to ease our discomfort? Because one of the, one of the cool things that's happened over the years, and when I've mentioned Occam's Razor before, uh, Occam's Razor is often misrepresented as the simplest explanation is often the best. And literally the the formal phrasing of that is what I mentioned earlier, which is don't multiply entities unnecessarily. The problem is, is that when you say God did it, that feels simple to people. And so they think they're consistent with God, with, with, with Occam's razor. And so they're saying, ah, well, you presuppose logic and dignity and morality and all these other things, which isn't necessarily true. I'm just using those all as, as examples. I find, I think that some of them are derivative, but you presuppose all those things, and all I have to do is presuppose God. So I have fewer entities, and it's simple. Except that that God presumption comes with a load of baggage and a lot of manipulation, including getting it to be the thing that does not require an additional justification. And there are questions. Um, well, let me let me finish this part. Uh, we're debating the part that's not common. Now, whether or not we can justify those things that we agree on, I don't. I'm not convinced that we can. Um, otherwise, there wouldn't be this debate. Uh, we'd just agree. Yep, we can or we can't. So I think what we're starting to talk to is about, and, and, and this may be a bit of a cheat on my part, but about certainty. Because that's the thing that seems to pervade this in the, well, what is your confidence level? Or what is your like if you were to, to, to try to quantify your rational justification in X, and if you begin with a presupposition, uh, nothing that, that is derived from a standard can be more accurate than the standard. So if I have a, a, a watch that doesn't keep good time or I have a ruler that isn't to a standard, all of my measurement, none of my measurements with that can be more accurate than the standard that I'm going with. And so we have this grand unknown about logic and whether or not it is in fact absolute and inviolable as it seems to appear. And, and even in pure, pure reasoning terms, uh, you, you're automatically led to presuppositions. You would have to assume they were true in order to prove they weren't true. You would have to, and, and that gets us to the assumptions about truth. For me, what I often see is this assertion that your worldview can't justify this and therefore you have no grounds to say anything or do anything else. And when I, when I hear that, it seems to me that somebody's saying, you can't be absolutely certain, even if you could be reasonably certain. And so what I don't think you can be absolutely certain about anything. And I've in the past talked about what I described uh, as 
I I fully acknowledge that I am a um, a dilettante and and not a, a degreed or credentialed person in this field at all. So I work things out on my own based on others. But it's what I described as maximal certainty. If I begin with there is a reality and the laws of logic appear to be inviolate, and I will re I will revise that the second somebody demonstrates that the laws of logic can be violated or don't always apply. I don't know how they could do that. But then everything that is deductively arrived from those, like mathematics, I would say you can be maximally certain about because it, the deduction from logic leads to essentially the same level uh, of certainty, not in your actual results, because we can always, you know, forget to carry the one or something. But mathematics itself is de deductively derived from that. And so we can be maximally certain. Other things are inductively derived. And so there's a lower standard of certain certainty that doesn't approach maximal. And maximal could be absolute. If the laws of logic are absolute, then maximal becomes absolute. It's just that I don't have any way to demonstrate that. For everything else, we have a lower confidence level. And a la Hume, the wise man proportions his belief to the evidence. Um, and so recognizing that I live in a world and I don't think I can be absolutely certain about anything, but that doesn't mean that I'm in a state of chaos and can't determine anything. I live in a world that is apparently reasonable where we have scientific methods, which, by the way, science doesn't make any proclamations about truth or claim any sort of certainty. Science is always about, this is our tentative conclusions based on the best current evidence. It's always subject to revision. Nobody's claiming that, you know, the moon absolutely, well, all right, I was going to go with green cheese, but there is the thing where you can, you may not know what something is, but you can still demonstrate what it isn't, you know, that, that this doesn't apply. Um, so I have a belief in an external world. I agree that that is a transcendental view, but as long as you and I agree that we share the same reality, which we must do, otherwise we wouldn't have agreed to reschedule this debate and come on here and talk there, then that's all we need to then begin to have a discussion about whether or not we have foundations beyond that. So th there's a problem that was stated very early in, in the, the last 10 minutes or so, uh, where you were like going to try to put it in some sort of syllogistic form. I don't think we really got there, but I think I might have a better understanding, which is there's a whole bunch of trans, uh, transcendental categories. And if those categories are to be made coherent and sensible, then they require a justification. And you believe that you've found that justification. This is a problem that I have with the coherent model of truth. And that is, you're absolutely right, Jay. As long Because the coherent model of truth is one where you truth um, is coherent with a set of propositions. And one of the propositions that you're including is these things have a foundation. That is the proposition that I reject. I'm not saying it's false. I can't demonstrate that they don't have a foundation. I'm just saying there's been no demonstration that they do. I don't see any reason why these things aren't true in and of themselves in much the same way that people would argue that God doesn't need a foundation in and of itself. To me, if there's no demonstration, if, if you, there's no way to demonstrate that that this could have been any other way, then we're on pretty good ground in saying the laws of logic have to be absolute, uh, or at least it's a reasonable, not quite maximally certain inference from the direct observations and the fact that these tools keep providing us with what appears to be consistent understandings of reality. Now, you can construct a justification for anything. And this is why if we're sitting at a card table, and full disclosure, I'm a magician, I can cheat at cards. And I deal out the cards and you get, we're playing bridge and you get 13 spades, you get the perfect bridge hand. Now, within the context of our understanding of the world, you could make a reasonable conclusion that perhaps I cheated, especially if you know you're sitting there with someone who's capable of dealing out pretty much whatever they want or seemingly dealing out whatever, whatever they want. And it would be easily argued that the worldview that includes Matt cheated would offer the best explanation, the most likely explanation for how you wound up with all 13 spades. Um, but that doesn't tell us whether or not that's actually true at all, because we know at least a couple of times in actual bridge tournaments, the perfect bridge hand has been dealt and there's no evidence of any cheating. We also know that it is possible as one of the many, uh, random outcomes of a shuffled deck of cards. 30 seconds, Matt. But it's more comforting to say, I don't know if he cheated or not, but boy, it sure would make a lot more sense if he cheated 
that's completely independent from whether it's true, which gets us back to what I was saying earlier, that the belief that there's a God that serves as a foundation may be comforting, but I see no demonstration that it's necessary or true. Uh, really good statements there. Um, the first thing I would point out is that uh, when you said that we appeal to God to uh, ease our discomfort, um, my first argument would be that that is a, an appeal to emotion. Uh, that's not a valid argument. That's actually a fallacy to appeal to the fact that the people that believe this or go down this route are doing it because of psychological motivation. So I don't think that's a valid argument. I would say next that uh, the idea that um, you have the ability to distinguish between the categories that are maximally certain, such as abstract numbers, et cetera, versus the things that are derived from induction, scientific experimentation, empiricism. The ability to make that, distingu that distinction itself presupposes some true category once again. So while I recognize that you wanted to sort of qualify by moving into the category of maximally certain and not absolutely certain, that's fine. You can use whichever terms you want to use from my perspective. It doesn't matter to me because I don't believe that you would be able to have in the pragmatic perspective a justification for any kind of truth whatsoever. In fact, the whole system quite literally should lead directly into solipsism and total relativism. Now, I know that you don't necessarily accept total relativism because, as you said, we have a common world, a common uh, uh, something area where we, where we can dialogue about these things and have the debate. So we don't believe in total relativism. However, in order to not believe in total relativism, again, assumes these categories, assumes these things that you seem to admit, but don't think that they necessarily presuppose or lead to any kind of a personal God. And I, and I understand why you're saying that. But so I want to stress that I don't think, uh, uh, the appeal to discomfort is a valid argument. I don't think that you have the ability to have even maximal certainty and I don't believe that you can construct a justification for anything. So the example that you gave was a, a case where you could, you know, you, uh, you cheated at cards, et cetera, et cetera, and somebody could build a case or whatever. Uh, when it comes to normative day-to-day uh, -day kinds of activities or um, what you could call normative logic, that could be true. Yes, there's a lot of situations where we would have, through induction, limited amounts of certainty. But the strength of the transcendental argument, the strength of the argument that's being presented here is that there are some things that are so fundamental that to deny them or doubt them, which theoretically one could doubt them, but to actually live or to actually consistently try to doubt them and not live according to them or not uh, you know, debate according to them, would lead to such a fundamental breakdown of the coherence of one's belief system or even the possibility of knowledge, the possibility of operating in the world, of predicating uh, about objects in the world, of knowing things in the world or doing science at all. Those types of things are so fundamental that they're, I'm arguing, even stronger uh, as an argument. They're, they're maximally certain to whatever degree you want to posit. They're at, if you want to say absolute or not absolute, that's fine. It doesn't matter to me. Um, I don't have a problem using the terms of you know warranted beliefs or highly warranted or maximally or whatever, because really those are just humanly derived terms that are trying to describe the strongest level of certainty possible. So I believe that, the, that those kinds of transcendental categories are not only maximally certain or necessary, but that they don't operate independently. They actually presuppose and interact with one another, which is kind of why I started the debate talking about the three branches of philosophy which make up a worldview. These things all, uh, I believe, cohere and kind of presuppose and are tied together with one another. For example, it wouldn't make any sense to talk about uh, the past experiences and can I have a, a, a rational belief in past experiences uh, if, I didn't believe that there was a self that had those experiences. It seems that that these two things kind of go together. Um, being able to predicate about objects in the external world, right, kind of assumes that objects in the external world have identity over time, right? That I can pick out one object amongst many objects, and so that's the problem of the one and the many, right? So any any kinds of examples like this tend to, we, we I would say, kind of assume all these transcendental categories together, even if we're only focusing on maybe one area here or there. Maybe we're only talking about linguistics. A lot of modern philosophers, P.F. Strawson, Carl Otto Apple, they've done a lot of work in transcendental arguments as they apply to language and linguistics. How many things, it's kind of amazing how many things we presuppose just in communication, just in subject predicate relations and sentences, just in trying to to communicate that information to another bunch of, of gray matter. The the intricacy, the complexity in this is 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 
fascinating. It's, 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 it's phenomenal, actually. Um, and so what I think is so strong about this argumentation is that we're not just arguing that it's a kind of a model up here in the abstract that's pretty cool, like some big World of Warcraft scheme that we've, we've invented that really doesn't have anything to do with the external world. I'm saying that, no, when, when I have a friend who's a rocket scientist, he, he's done contract work for NASA, he does, designs Blackhawks, right? He talks about the, the amazing complexity of the algorithms that he works with. Now, I'm not a mathematician, right? I know about math theory in terms of philosophy, but I don't do the abstract, you know, uh, calculus that he does to how to build, you know, Blackhawks, right? Um, but to him, at least in his mind as an engineer and many other engineers and mathematicians who utilize math in, in engineering, is that they see the practical application of this very abstract realm into the here and the now. And if something's wrong in the equation, the Blackhawk's not going to fly. It's going to crash, right? So he has to be very precise. He has to be very clear in the way that he gets it all perfectly right. And so it's not just in the realm of the abstract. It's also very present in the here and the now. And that's just mathematics. So what I think if we reorient our perspective, when we look at the power and possibility of transcendental arguments, we're not just saying something theoretical. We're actually mapping this onto reality and saying that all of reality kind of presupposes this kind of a God. And that itself is the argument. So again, one could conceivably say I don't accept transcendental arguments, but I think that that would lead to a bunch of dead ends. And a reductio is a valid argument. If, we, if we're led to dead ends when we deny this thing over here, to me, I think that's one of the strongest possible arguments. A um, couple other last points on uh, uh, Matt's uh, uh, last statements there was that I think when he says that uh, coherentism, he, when he was listing coherentism, he talked about how your beliefs don't have a foundation. Well, I'm not trying to fault Matt as if he necessarily doesn't understand this. Maybe he misspoke, but the coherentism is not about foundations. It's actually about the coherence of the web of beliefs, right? So there's two models. The foundationalist model is like self-evident maxims and then beliefs on top of the self-evident maxims and then beliefs that lead to further beliefs that lead to further beliefs, right? So that's foundationalism and it has foundations. We don't have that model, right, when it comes to uh, webs of beliefs and when it comes to paradigms and worldviews that are justified in terms of coherentism. So that's because uh, if I'm thinking about uh, logic over here in this arena, maybe I'm talking about the laws of logic, that's not disconnected from who I am. That's not disconnected from my belief in God. It's not disconnected from ethics that we ought to be logical, that we ought to reason from premise to valid conclusion, right? So it's all connected in our view. And I think that's a better method, a better way of understanding truth, propositions, uh, beliefs, claims, et cetera. So uh, I would say that I think Matt's position, while he did ask some good questions, kind of misunderstood and made a couple uh, uh, logical violations there. And the response that what if there's no explanation? Well, I would say that if we're here to debate and if we want to debate theism, um, I would say that if Matt wants to say that there's all these things that he utilizes, but doesn't necessarily think that they're true in the external world per se, laws of logic and all that, truth with a capital T or whatever, um, I would say that Matt's being arbitrary. And if Matt can be arbitrary, then I can say God just is, right? So if arbitrariness is allowed, if we can be ad hoc, then I think that the debate is over because that would be a violation of the laws of debate. But of course, we don't believe that we can be arbitrary or ad hoc. And so therefore, we can't just say, well, the laws of logic just are. Uh, uh, I forget Matt's phrase. He said that truth is what maps up to reality or, or uh, belief that conforms to reality. That's a metaphysical claim, right? That's a metaphys metaphysical statement about the external world, right? Now, I'm not, I know Matt would only say that, well, that's maximally certain in a pragmatic sort of sense. Okay, fair enough. But um, it still doesn't work to say it just is, because once we've admitted it just is, then that's being arbitrary and ad hoc. Right, right. Jay, good one. Uh, you're right down there. I was just about to give you a 30 second warning. Um, so let's see, where are we at? That was your third one. Matt, this will be your third one coming up. Am I right? Am I on track here, folks? All Hi. right. I don't think this one will take the whole 10 minutes. All right. Well, feel free. The mic is yours, and then we'll switch gears into uh, something else. Sure. Uh, so Jay's ba basically just saying that if I can arbitrarily say the laws of logic just are, then he can just arbitrarily say that God is. He's completely right, except that's not what's happening. I'm not arbitrarily saying the laws of logic just are. I'm not even asserting that they just are. 
I am recognizing that I have no reason to think that they could be anything other than what they appear to be, which is uh, inviolate and absolute. I'm not saying they are absolute. I'm saying it's my presupposition. And that presupposition is supported by the continued reliability of these things. And yes, there's something in there that's always going to be circular, which is why we call him a presupposition. But what, but when Jay, what he's really doing is admitting that he's presupposing a foundation to the thing that I'm presupposing. And okay, you can, you can call it arbitrary, you can call whatever. I'm saying the whole point of this discussion is we both agree on the absolutes. And my view is I do, I'm not aware of any way that they can be have a foundation. I'm not sure that there's any way to demonstrate that they have a foundation. And presupposing a foundation, you can say it's an emotional appeal. I don't, what other reason would somebody have to presuppose a foundation to something that can't be demonstrated or hasn't been demonstrated to have a foundation other than their discomfort with the lack of a foundation? Because I'm not convinced that even, even the foundation that they're presupposing can do what they think it'll do. And I'll get to that in just a second. Um, he said, all of reality presupposes a God. That's just a bald assertion. I'm part of reality as far as I can tell. I don't presuppose a God, so that's clearly false. But in the context of what he was actually saying, he, he seems to be claiming that all of this necessitates a God. And when he refers to you know the use of a reductio ad absurdum, I agree, I got no problem with a reductio, but no, finding a dead end in your constructed reductio doesn't mean that your other proposition is correct. There are two things that need to happen in order for that reductio to be of any use. The first is that you have to demonstrate that there is a, necess a necessity of an explanation for X, and then all other possible explanations for X uh, fail. And the, neither of those has been has been done by any stretch of the imagination. I, I'm, you know, where's the demonstration that there must be an explanation that it couldn't just be so? I'm not saying it is just so, which I was kind of accused of, but I'm just going to say that was talking quickly and that there was no malice in in misrepresenting it. I'm not saying it has to be so. I'm saying where's the demonstration that it, it that it is necessary that it can't be so. And we haven't gone through all other possibilities uh, to show that they lead to a dead end. We haven't even gone through the, the, the raw theism versus non-theism view to show that this doesn't have an explanation. Because just because we don't have an explanation for something today that is consistent with a worldview that doesn't include a God doesn't mean that that's not going to happen at a later time. This is, this is the thing about skepticism. There may be some things for which we will never have an explanation. That's incredibly, we're all uncomfortable with not knowing. I wasn't trying to make an emotional appeal. I think that's how humans operate. Our discomfort with not knowing is what makes us seek answers. It's the reason we're having this potential discussion today because if Jay can successfully present something that convinces me, well, now there's another person ostensibly on his side. And if I can, if I can show that we're, Jay's made a mistake in assuming something that isn't necessary and can't be demonstrated, well, then maybe I have an ally on my side. I don't think either one of us came in today thinking that we were going to change the other person's mind. I don't do this. I mean, I'd be happy if Jay and I wound up agreeing on stuff, but I do it for the people who are listening so that they can hear a discussion about this. And especially in areas like, you know, deep philosophical concepts where I'm not remotely an expert. I just think what I think and, and, and for my reasons. Um, but I can do my best to explain it. I'm not, as you know, you talked about language. Uh, I'm not, as, I would never assume that Jay and I have the exact same understanding of word usage. As a matter of fact, I would assume the exact opposite, that there are things where we're going to have a different understanding of a word, a different understanding of a concept. But my presumption coming in here is that we both speak English and have an understanding of usage that is sufficient for us to be able to discuss things, to find the areas where we agree. Like, if, if, hey, what do you mean by this word? What do you mean by God? Um, okay, well, now we can have this secondary discussion. I think, you know, I'm, that's the only assumption I'm making is that there's a likelihood that we can come to an agreement on terms and communicate ideas. And I, I think that it's evident that we're actually succeeding at that. But the, the notion that a God could serve as a foundation for the laws of logic, in, in addition to what, no demonstration of necessity, and I'm not sure what the warrant is apart from an assertion that there is a need and atheism or a, a non-theistic view of the world doesn't fill that, is this. Can God change, alter, or violate the laws of logic? Because if so, then they're not guaranteed. And if not, then he's not the guarantor. He is now subject to those same laws. And the second problem is that we all recognize, I would hope, 
that each of us is a flawed thinker, that we not only uh, have varying IQs and varying understandings and various biases that come in and the, the process by which we learn, every single one of us makes mistakes. And we can't even guarantee that we're that the model of reality that is in our head actually maps to an actual reality. That's that's a kind of a, an assumption we're making as well when we're talking about solipsism. And so if we are flawed in our thinking, how can a God, even a perfect God, make your flawed mind correct and warranted without making your mind unflawed? It is like pouring clean water through a dirty filter. And so the fact that you are convinced that there's a God out there that serves as a foundation for logic doesn't mean there is one. And even if that God does exist and does serve as the foundation for logic, there's no way for that God to demonstrate that to you in w to the point where you would have uh, the essentially absolute or maximal epistemic warrant unless that God makes your mind completely not flawed, at which case there would be no more debate or discussion. It would just be, hey, this is the way it works. And we'd go, gosh, because we would have godlike mentality. And so I don't know how uh, even, a, you know, I don't know how to overcome those problems. The laws of logic are our descriptions of abstract truths, which, OK, I'll, I'll set aside the presupposing of truth or the discussions about truth. Um, and I don't know that it's not the case that something can't simply be true, um, that this is the way it is. And in fact, it could not have been any other way. If, if we look at the laws of logic and they could not have been any other way, which is what it appears to be, even though we can't be absolutely confident about that, then it would seem to me patently absurd to suggest that there's something that must exist that serves as a guarantee that it couldn't be any other way, if in fact it couldn't have been any other way. All right, excellent. Um, great discussion, you guys. Uh, that uh, concludes the first hour of uh, our talk here. So, Jay, over to you for uh, you know what you want to do next. Do we want to do like a conversational now? I, I'm up for whatever. I mean, if there's okay. questions from from the chat or super chat, we can do those. If you have questions for me, I mean, I I asked a few questions there at the at the yeah. end, which I'm sure. Yeah, let me address those and. Uh, yeah. We'll get to the super chats here towards the, the last uh, section. So um, the first thing I would say is that you talked about um, what what I was saying was that when it comes to the domain of philosophy where we do debates, where we do uh, argumentation, to say, I mean, it's fine to say that you believe that we seek justification for our beliefs, perhaps at times out of uh, psychological motivations for comfort. But that doesn't translate into um, an argument in a debate. So just because, uh, and, it, and it could be entirely the case. It could be the case that maybe maybe a person is only arguing for the existence of God uh, because uh, of of psychological motivations, and, and they're weak people, and they want they want to have comfort. But I still think that that's a, a fallacious argument in terms of strict logic. It's, it's not valid to the truth or falsity of God's existence. So when we're talking about logical necessity, we're talking about something that's a little more forceful and it's a little more strict. And again, it doesn't matter if we limit the certitude or the, 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 the trueness to maximal certainty. It really doesn't matter because I think the argument that I'm trying to present is that if we had the system of truth that you had, if we had your worldview, it would and should lead us down a certain path, a consistent path of solipsism, of total skepticism, if we were to follow through with those conclusions but that the point is that that you're not really doing that you're still utilizing things that that wouldn't make sense given your presuppositions and that is itself the argument so a as a skeptic and somebody who essentially teaches about skepticism i often get asked this thing about can you be too skeptical and of course my answer is no because what they're generally be talking about there is is not skepticism it's cynicism skepticism is an ideology in an ideological sense is i want my internal model of reality to match the reality i experience as best as possible um and so you you've a couple times now suggested that my worldview should lead me down a path of total skepticism well, I am a total skeptic in the sense that I have doubts about everything. I am not absolutely certain about anything, but that doesn't mean that I don't have reasonable confidence in things that are based on the foundation of logic. Now, if we're going to have the conversation about what's beyond logic, which 
is apparently what we're trying to do. Yeah, but the, criticizing the view is just one more attempt to say, oh, there must be a foundation. Well, where's the demonstration that there must be a foundation? What is the, what are the consequences if there's not a foundation to logic? Right, the, but the argument is that you don't have a basis or ability consistently to appeal to logic itself, setting aside the justification of whether... I have the same basis everybody else does. I'm convinced that it is reliable, as are you. The difference between us is that you are convinced that you found why right. it's reliable. That's not so. It, but 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 that for, was why I asked the the, prince, the the question about induction, right? So induction and and saying that you're convinced about it, uh, it would presumably mean that you think that it works, right? It's pragmatic. Yeah, it works. We both agree with that. So does pretty right. much everybody else on the planet for the entire. Right, but that's but but just saying something works is, is a value judgment, right? That you're using another category to try to say that that's why this thing is true. But ultimately, that would be circular. Yes, that, so the the whole thing is I've acknowledged a presupposition. Why? How on earth is it as a counter to me to say, oh, you're presupposing this? Right, because on the the worldview that you have, those kinds of things shouldn't exist. That's that's absolutely not true. So th this is where we're always going to get in trouble. You make an assertion about my worldview and about what shouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. My worldview is that I accept this because of a demonstration of its continued reliability. I that's have called no induction, right? And that's not a justification. That's just saying that it is, right? So in logical justification, that was why I pointed to Hume all the way up to Quine. They still say that this is not a, a belief or a, a view that can be justified. Yes, and I agree. I, I see no justification. You're asserting there is a justification. And when I ask for what it is, you're just asserting that, well, my worldview collapses without it. And you even asserted that these sorts of I'm, things shouldn't exist. Stop. You should have asserted these sort of things shouldn't have existed in my worldview. Where's the demonstration that my worldview should not include things that are just true or, better yet, that are reasonably presupposed because of their continued uh, demonstration of efficacy? Because they would be, that would be being ad hoc and being arbitrary. And I'm saying the justification is that in a world where there is a God, the doctrine of providence actually makes sense why there's induction and the regularity that's in nature. I'm not aware of a world where, the, world where there is a God. I'm aware of a world where there are people who are convinced there's a God and who are convinced it serves as a foundation. But this but, is the argument right here. Right. And so where's the demonstration for that other than the an assertion? debate right now is the demonstration. No, it's not. I mean, if we're just if we're just going to make flat out assertions, then you, you assert you're right. That's an it's argument. It's not an argument. You haven't presented a single argument for the for the for the entire thing. You've co presented colloquial, kind no. of loose arguments, but there's not. the The whole thing is you just you, you claimed that this shouldn't exist in my worldview, that logical absolutes could not be true under my worldview. The fact that I you're presupposing that there is an explanation for why they are absolute rather than just recognizing that they are. That would be being arbitrary and being ad hoc, and typically in debates, that's not allowed. It's... Wow. Hey, Jay, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, we are getting some complaints as you guys are doing the more free-form conversations, so if you can, if you guys can kind of like... I, I hate to interrupt the flow, but we are getting some echo on your mic, Jay, so if you can really okay, ride that I'm mute. Okay, I'm not talking on mute, yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. It's so it would only be arbitrary if I were asserting these things are in fact absolute and inviolable. That is not my position at all. No. My position. That's not that's not all that that's not all that's required to be arbitrary. Being arbitrary or ad hoc is just saying something simply is and I can appeal to this thing and I don't have to justify it. I don't have to give any reasons for a okay. co coherent basis for it. I don't know how many times I can explain the same thing. I'm not saying and have never said these are the way things, the, the logical absolutes are the way things are and I don't have to justify it. I've not said that. I've not implied that or anything else. I'm saying I am convinced that they are and I am not convinced that they have or need a justification. So stop misframing what my position is so that it is a straw man to knock down. I have never said the logical, ab well, I probably have said 
15 years ago or whatever, but not throughout the course of this debate, that the logical absolutes are in fact true and don't need justification. I'm saying I don't see a need or any demonstration that they do need a justification. There, There's a huge difference. It's the difference between I am not convinced this person is guilty and I am in fact convinced this person is innocent. Those are different things. So why is that not being ad hoc or arbitrary? It's not, it's not arbitrary. You got an echo. Okay. It's not ad hoc because I'm not offering an explanation for how they are. I'm not, I'm not even, I'm not even acknowledging that there could be an explanation for how they are. There's been no demonstration that they require an explanation. So it's not ad hoc in that sense of, I'm because ad hoc would be, providing a justification for something. I'm not providing a justification for it. I'm saying I, I don't even know that there could be or that there is a justification for it. Do you see how that's not ad hoc? Well, I mean, you can say that that's not ad hoc, but I don't see how it's not, because typically when we talk about in the domain of epistemology justifying beliefs and justifying claims, it requires some kind of explanation. Now, you can do that. I, know, I understand you're doing that, you're saying that, but I don't think that that's a coherent answer, and I think that you're led to that conclusion because of the beliefs in the rest of the system, because it would require the admission of other things that are not compatible with the other beliefs that you have, namely the atheistic agnostic type views. Let me try this another way. How could it possibly be an ad hoc explanation to say, I am not aware that there is or needs to be an explanation? Because that's being arbitrary. It doesn't need one, right? I asked how is that possible? So, so let me frame it this way. So there's disciplines that are called meta-disciplines, right? Meta-ethics, meta-mathematics, meta-logic. These are real disciplines that people study. Now, one could say that they're not real disciplines and dismiss it or whatever. But when we talk about giving a justification or giving an explanation for things or, or explaining how they could be in the rest of one's worldview, I don't think that that's a, an invalid question. And you've said that you don't believe that it needs a justification. I, again, it you can say that that's not arbitrary, but it, to me it sounds arbitrary. On the worldview where God exists, there's regularity in nature because of providence, because God has set the world up to be regular. And that's how we can do the, the, the scientific method. That's how we can do logic. That's how we can do math. The world operates in a regular way. But when we don't have that, and we just say that we only have our immediate sense experience, we only have what's pragmatic, then we're led to these foolish conclusions. Okay, I'm a fool. No, I'm not saying you're a fool in terms of a pejorative. No, I'm saying... Yes, yes, you are. And this is the problem. I'm not offering any... You're echoing. I'm not offering an explanation, so it can't be an ad hoc explanation. What I, And I'm not saying this does not require justification. I'm saying where's the demonstration that it does? I'm not aware that... And and I, you you at least presuppose one thing that you think does not require a foundation, right? Oh, correct. Correct. So you presuppose one thing that you don't think requires a foundation, and yet you want to criticize my presupposition, which does not say this does not require a foundation, but instead says, I am not yet convinced that it needs a foundation. I haven't asserted that it doesn't. There could be there could be some foundation as far as I know. You could be right about the foundation as far as I know. It's just there's no demonstration that there is a foundation or that you have found the right one. What you've found is one that is consistent and appears to serve as that, but only because, if anything, and I was going to go avoid doing this, you seem to be making an ad hoc explanation for the foundation of logic in there's a personal God agent who serves as the guarantor for something which we haven't even demonstrated needs a guarantor or could be guaranteed. Uh, and sorry, lost it for a second there. Uh, so there's an ad hoc explanation there, which is one step removed from the thing that we both agree on. Yeah, well, in response to that, I would say that when you say that down the road, maybe we'll have an answer to these things, that seems to me to be kind of a leap of faith. Uh, the I, idea that, that down the road, we can answer these things, right? Um, but again, that's probably the most frustrating thing is because I did not say that. This is this you did is the, say you said down the road. I wrote it down when you were talking. Down the answer, down the no, road, perhaps we'll have an answer to this justification. I so the point here is that I don't know that we won't have. See, you seem the point in my That's response so different than saying maybe we will. Yes, it is. Say okay, here we go. 
your your case is that a worldview without a god cannot offer an explanation for the logical absolutes. We'll just stick with that one and not all the other ones. My position is, and I was talking specifically about your argument about using a reductio, essentially saying that, you know, under God, there's an explanation, or it'd be a, uh, screw it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip that, because uh, I was looking for the particular sil disjunctive syllogism, essentially showing that, you know, with God, we have an explanation, without God, we don't have an explanation, therefore, God. Um, what I said was, in a reductio, you have to demonstrate that there is a necessity for an explanation in this case, and simply getting to a dead end, which was your language, which I went down, does not mean you've demonstrated the truth of the other one, because a dead end now does not mean that there won't be an explanation down the line. I did not say we will find it. I didn't even say, well, if I, if I said we might find it, that I'm talking in a philosophical sense. I'm not saying that it's true. We're likely to find it. I also acknowledged we may never find it, and I'm fine with that one because I don't have any demonstration that there is an explanation. Well, I would reply by saying that that you claim to be a proponent of the skeptical tradition, that you're within that tradition of skepticism. And I'm very read in that tradition, and I respect a lot of areas of, of the skeptical tradition. But whether we go back to Descartes and his meditations when he begins to question things, or whether it's Hume or whether it's the more modern skeptics, they're very interested in questioning justification, questioning epistemic claims, questioning meta-level questions. They're asking all those meta-level questions. They're very interested in how we do or can't justify laws of logic, numbers, all those different things. So it's not within, it's not unfair to bring those issues up because they're the heart of the issue, especially in the history of epistemology. I mean, you can read an epistemology textbook that's common, bonjour, something like this, and you'll find that the, the whole of the textbook is debates about coherentism and foundationalism and justifying claims. Now, one could say, I don't really care, or I don't, it doesn't matter to me or whatever, but in a debate, what's presupposed is some question or some rule, right, by which we go by these rules to confirm or deny the case, right? And I think what you've missed or tended to miss is that the transcendental argument is not just an argument that's a reductio against some other position. It's a positive argument that's about all of those transcendental categories. And if those transcendental categories are actually necessary and if they're actually very strong arguments themselves, then the argument for God itself is also strong, and it's also a positive argument. It's not just a negative argument about, well, I can find a, a flaw in your worldview, therefore mine's true. That's not the totality of the argument. The totality of the argument is that this worldview is coherent because I can look at all those different paradigmatic claims and preconditions, and they make sense, they're coherent. Uh, when I look at the system over here, and you can say I don't have a system, you can say, I'm not saying you said that, but a person could say as a skeptic, I don't have a holistic system, I just have the best that I can go by with maximal certainty and pragmatic approaches. But that still has claims that are necessary and implicit about metaphysics, about epi epi uh, epistemology, and about ethics. Even if you don't want to go down any of those specific routes, it still uh, has a, a, a necessary implication. If I were to say I'm a total skeptic and I don't think that I know anything is true, that's still a claim about metaphysics, about ethics, and about epistemology, even if I don't want it to go there. So, we're echoing, but... The issue here is whether or not there's a God and you're presenting an argument for, for the existence of God based on the necessity of an explanation for logic, among other things, or as a foundation for it. My response is, you haven't demonstrated that this is a necessity, you've just asserted that the absence of such, such an explanation leads to problems, but those problems presuppose that there is an explanation. There's been no demonstration that the laws of logic could have been any other way, or that there's any case that they, ha that, that they need some sort of guarantor. And when I try to point this out, you've, on, on a couple of occasions, completely misframed what I was talking about. The card example, which I agree is and I know you didn't raise this objection, but somebody, I'm not watching chat, but I'm sure somebody out there was complaining about, you know, this analogy, that's within, you know, the reality, and you can, you know, provide evidence, and it doesn't fit within the transcendental thing. Yes, it's an analogy. I get it. The thing is, it would be a coherent, if you don't know whether or not how you ended up with 13 spades, it would be a coherent um, explanation 
to believe that I cheated because if you're not sure whether I believe, and you're not sure whether or not I cheated or whether somebody there cheated, then you're in this state of, I don't know. And this is why I was talking about our discomfort with not knowing. I wasn't using as it is an emotional fallacy. It's just a fact. We are uncomfortable with not knowing. It's the reason we seek answers. It's the reason why we presuppose in some cases that something may have an answer when we might be wrong about whether or not it has an answer. And so the card cheating example there, of course, if you sit across from me at the table and you get that, Almost anybody is going to be tempted to say, wow, I bet somebody cheated because everything makes a lot more sense if in fact somebody cheated. And that might make you more comfortable rather than not knowing that maybe I'm not saying that is the reason for doing it. You can convince yourself in a worldview where Matt cheated. Now, all of a sudden, this outcome makes a lot more sense. And you're right. I acknowledge that at the outset of the debate at the very beginning. But that has nothing to do with whether or not I actually cheated. That has everything to do with your comfort or discomfort with not knowing. And if you're convinced that I did cheat, then of course that's going to be a satisfying answer. And it would probably be satisfying for almost anybody there as long as they didn't care whether or not it was actually true. And I care whether or not things are actually true to the best that we can find out. And so I can't make a leap to, oh, there must be a God that serves as a foundation for logic because I'm not yet convinced that logic needs a foundation. I, I see. And I think I see the, the point of departure now. So basically where I would disagree, where I think we're talking past is about the issue of different types of proofs and different types of things. So, for example, your, your analogy is fine when it comes to matters of normative daily life, normative discourse. But when it's issues, I would argue, that are so fundamental and paradigmatic that they destroy the possibility of knowledge or predication or logic ethics at all. They're different from the kinds of claims or beliefs that we have that that speak to what you're talking about with your example. So for example, if I deny the laws of logic, there's a, there's something very fundamental about argumentation, living, speaking, communicating that's completely destroyed, right? If I, if I deny them, if I doubt them, if I don't think they have a, 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 a true existence, if they're not real, if they're just social constructs, that's a much more damaging thing to doubt than if I doubt that uh, little Wayne has moved in next door to me, right? I might see a dude with dreads and I think it's little Wayne over there, therefore little Wayne has moved. And now if I'm wrong about that, it doesn't destroy my whole worldview to be wrong about that. If I deny basic laws of logic, it does destroy my whole worldview. And so not everything is proven the exact same way. And so because those kinds of things are much more fundamental, much more powerful and paradigmatic, that's why it's such a strong argument. And that's why they do require a justification. I mean, the argument that you gave about the cards you are giving a kind of justification. You're saying that we can't always go by the appearances of things, and I would agree with that. But it's different when we're talking about paradigmatic level presuppositions, and that's why transcendentals are different than normative argumentation and logic. Yeah, first of all, I don't know how that's special pleading, but going on about the consequences, oh, you need to mute. Uh, going on about the consequences of denying the laws of logic seems completely irrelevant because I'm not doing that. See. You're, you're trying to argue for a foundation behind the laws of logic. That's the part that I'm denying, but not the laws of logic themselves. And so I would agree, if you deny the laws of logic, then you, we can't have any kind of conversation. We can't do anything. We are forced, essentially, to recognize these things, and denial of them would lead to chaos, except that I'm not doing that at all. I am denying your bald assertion that there must be a foundation. Yeah, but uh, as a skeptic, shouldn't we have a justification for things that we believe in? Yes, and that's why I've been so strong on pointing out the difference between saying I am convinced of X, I am not convinced of X, and I am convinced of not X. As a skeptic, I want to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible, and I proportion my confidence level in what I believe to the available evidence for it, of which for the the evidence of a foundation for the logical absolutes, zero evidence. The evidence that God serves as a foundation, zero evidence, as far as I can tell, for any of these things. My position is not the laws of logic are in fact absolute and inviolable, other than they appear to be, and we should operate as if they are until there's such time as there's a demonstration when they're not. That that the these things continually demonstrate. We can't have conversations without them. They are as close to, if they're not absolute, they're as close as I think any of us could possibly imagine. 
And so my position is not they don't require a foundation because that would be an assertion that I would have to defend. I'd have a burden of proof. How did you come to the conclusion they don't need a foundation? I didn't come to that conclusion. I am not yet convinced that they do because I have not, nobody's demonstrated that, and you and I would agree, at, at least within your worldview, there's at least one thing that does not require a foundation. And so given that, you know, I, I'm not sure whether or not there's one thing that doesn't require a foundation or two things that doesn't require a foundation or zero things that doesn't require a foundation. Those are things that we can't don't seem to be able to demonstrate. Well, at that point, I would say that when it comes to the question of demonstration and, and how that's been used in epistemology and, and philosophy, I appreciate that admission, because if we're believing in things because they work and they don't have to be justified, that's not skepticism. Skepticism is interested in asking those questions. And I understand you, what you're saying, and I appreciate the attempt to be consistent, but I don't think that it's ultimately consistent because you can't just say, well, I, you know, I just, I don't see why they have to be justified because that is being arbitrary. It's being ad hoc. And you can say it's not being arbitrary because you don't see a reasoning why it has to be, but that's the whole skeptical truth. That's why skeptics do what they do is to try to justify claims, to try to justify beliefs, to try to justify systems. Yes. And so, and, and so, and you could say, I don't, I, we're not, not going to do that. We try. And if we don't find a justification, we keep trying. We're still echoing, but we, yes. So first of all, I, I'm, I'm sure Please, people who watch this later, don't beat Jay up too much for lecturing me about skepticism while arguing on behalf of, for a, a god. Um, skepticism is about wanting your internal model that, from an idealistic standpoint. Modern scientific scan to match reality. Modern scientific skepticism is about testing as best we can. But that's, that's within the context of testing fact claims about reality. So that modern scientific skepticism isn't going to address whether or not logic has a foundation. You're talking about almost an ancient Greek knowledge of skepticism that have, that has been discarded because it leads to... No, that's not true. Okay, well... They're the very questions that Hume and Quine asked. Yeah. That's they not ancient Greek. questions. They did not assert answers. That's the difference. You're asserting an answer. No, if you read William Van Orman Quine's essay, Two Dogmas of Empiricism, he says that they cannot be logically justified on empiricist grounds. Okay. That's why they're called two dogmas of empiricism, according to Quine's famous essay. Sure. Hesher? Yes, sir. Do we want to read some super chats? We're getting towards the last 15, 20 minutes. All right. Yeah, we are into the final segment here. Great discussion, you guys. Um, yeah, let's do that, Jay. Let's this is great. Yeah, uh, I'm uh I'm really enjoying it over here. And uh yeah, Jay, if you have any super chats, I guess now would be a good time to round those out. Franklin's as, one last, as one last clarification, uh, you can say whatever you want about Quine. I'm not beholden to Quine. I'm talking about my thing. And y y this notion of skepticism, I've already explained it over and over and over again, and you have yet to demonstrate any sort of problem with it, except to assert that I'm not a skeptic in the same way whoever the hell you reference is a skeptic, and I don't care. Fair enough. Uh, definitely one can take a different track, but um, I'm just interested in the, the history of different skeptics and how they talk and what they consider justification and how philosophy and epistemology typically speaks of justifying claims. But And I'm not. So, I'm interested in what's actually true and demonstrable, which is why we're stuck. Okay. Uh, so we'll go to Franklin Chan. He says, thanks for the debate. Thank you, Franklin. Jolene K says, uh, for the cause. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Jolene. Michael Flaherty, $100. Thank you, Michael. Finally, a real debate. This is all. Tanner Terry, $2, says, atheism saved. <laughs> Doorman, <laughs> Doorman 360 says, Jay bringing up Hume's argument uh, about induction being unjustifiable in a materialist worldview. Why would the same... Why would today be the same tomorrow for no reason? Yeah, I mean, that's essentially the uh, the, the argument. Tanner Terry, $5. To both debaters, what are the... Go ahead. Are, are we, are we going to address some of these? If you want to, sure. Some of, the, some of these, I mean, you know, when, when I say I don't, I don't care what Hume said or Quine said or anybody else, because, you know, I'm going to take pieces from different things, and I'm certainly not as well-versed on some of those as, as they are. I'm talking about what my position is and why. When we talk about uh, induction... Um, we live our entire lives by inference and induction. We begin with this assumption that tomorrow is pretty much going to be like today because the entire history of the world has continued to show that 
that's going to be the case. But we also do it with the recognition that tomorrow is not identical to today and that there are trends. So, yeah, you know, I, I don't expect that the Earth's going to stop spinning on its axis in the next 10 minutes. But I do it with the understanding that it's very likely that, and, and almost certain that it will stop spinning on its axis at some point in the future. And so when we talk about induction, th there's a reason it's it's not deduction, it's an approximation, it is an estimation, it's an inference about what things are gonna be like. But that is not the same as wild ass guessing, I guess is, is probably the, the best way to put that. And it's the reason why we rely on, on science, despite the fact that science is, is virtually a, almost entirely an inductive process. Yeah, and I would agree with everything that Matt just said. It's just that in the history of this debate that, that I'm bringing up, the question of justifying the belief in induction, the entire history of skepticism and empiricism, and from what I understand, Matt is an empiricist, uh, at least to some degree. The whole point of Quine's essay, I'm not saying that Matt has to agree with everything Quine uh, argues, but that Quine restated the argument from the time of Hume that it's a belief that can't be justified, and it's a belief that undergirds science. So the point is that science believes in things that cannot be logically justified. Therefore, the transcendental argument is the next logical step, and that's what I've been trying to argue throughout the debate. Tanner Terry, $5. To both debaters, what is the consequence of one's epistemology breaking down due to incoherence with their view of metaphysics and axiology? I, I don't know that there is. Um... Well, one of the consequences is is that if if I'm wrong, then, oh, well, no, actually, that's, that's not even it. So if my epistemology breaks down, um, I'd have to know in what way it broke down and know the consequences, because my position is not, the logical absolutes don't have a foundation. It's that I'm not aware of one or in a, a need for one. If, I, if it turns out that somebody was able to demonstrate that there is a need for one, um, that doesn't crush my worldview. All it does is add something that I have yet to be convinced of. I become convinced of something new. And so my worldview changes all the time every time I become convinced of something new across the board. And if there, if there was a further demonstration that, for example, not only do they have a foundation, but it is a god, and in particular, uh, the god of the Orthodox Christian tradition, well, then I would now be, I would no longer be an atheist because I would have to be convinced that the Orthodox Christian model of God uh, was real. Uh, it, it may not change my view on that being like I'm never going to worship uh, as out of out of an obligation or an expectation because I think that any being that would be deserving of worship could never demand it because that at least to my understanding would would put it in a position where we no longer be deserving but that's kind of off the track. But as far as my, I was one, I, I redefined knowledge, and and I'm sure I'll get beaten up for this. But I had so many conversations about the nature of belief and knowledge and how knowledge is a subset of belief. And there were people like, no, 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 no. Beliefs are a subset of knowledge. And, no, no, you're wrong. Knowledge is a subset of beliefs. They're the things you believe. And then there's some subset of that that you count as knowledge. And by and large, in a colloquial sense, when people talk about knowledge, not in a philosophical sense, because there, there you get to justify true belief. And now there's arguments over what's justified and what's true. In a colloquial sense, when people say, I know something, and they're not just talking about like familiarity or, or awareness, but they're talking about knowledge in the sense of epistemology. All they're really doing, from my experience, is expressing a confidence level. They're saying, I really, 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 really believe it. And so my working definition of knowledge was to say, uh, belief is anything that you are convinced is true or likely true. And knowledge are those beliefs that if you were to find out you were wrong, it would be dramatically worldview altering. You know, if I, I can claim to know, I don't know, whether or not my phone is turned on. Uh, but what I'm really saying is I'm confident my phone is still turned on because I haven't turned it off yet and I know the battery is pretty full and there's lots of good reasons. And so I would argue that my confidence level is really high and I know this. But I'm not saying I can't be wrong. And that's a fundamental difference because if, if in philosophy it's justified true belief and it turns out it's not true that my phone is on, then I could never count it as knowledge. And I don't think that's the way most of us use knowledge when we're talking about it in general. So I just went with... Uh, knowledge of those things we believe so strongly that if we were to find out they were wrong, it would be worldview altering. And if I don't have a position, like if I'm not convinced that, if I had a view that, at, that the laws of logic do not require a foundation, then yes, that would be worldview altering to find out it was wrong. But that's not my position. My position is not being convinced of something. It's the same for God. I'm not convinced. Okay. Depending on God, I may be convinced that a God doesn't exist depending on how it's defined. But generally speaking, I'm just not convinced that there is one. 
Right. I would reply to the question, what are the consequences of one's epistemology breaking down due to incoherence in their view of metaphysics and ax axiology? I would say it's uh, devastating. If, if the arguments and the positions that you're stating are so fundamentally unjustifiable, right? I mean, if I can't give an account for things in, the, in a philosophic and a logical, reasonable sense, which is often what we're required to do, this was so kind of ironic is in this kind of a debate is that it's always pressed upon the theist, which fair enough, yeah, we are making pretty grandiose claims, right? So we ought to be able to logically give an account, give, it, give, it, give it a justification for those kinds of claims. And I think that the transcendental argument is the case, it is the argument for the existence of God. And so it is pretty consistent with a coherent type, uh, coherence type of view in terms of epistemology. So I would say that uh, if one makes a fundamental paradigmatic flaw in one's epistemology, then their worldview and their system completely breaks down and is incoherent. Like, for example, if I say, I don't believe that there's an external world, right, or something like this, this would be so fundamental. If I don't believe that there's logic, right, that would be so fundamental that our whole system would collapse. And again, historically, uh, nobody's had a problem asking uh, can we investigate and justify these kinds of claims? And I know that Matt's not saying that you, you can't ask those things, but he's saying that he's not convinced that there is a need to justify those kinds of claims and those kinds of uh, um, positions. And again, I still think that it's arbitrary to say that I don't know and they don't require it. Because if you're going to utilize things, if you're going to believe in things and act as if those things are the case, there's nothing wrong with me in a debate asking for the justification for those kinds of things, because it's the same kind of question that you would ask about a theist. Now, the argument is that, and Matt many times said, but yeah, but you're saying that God is circular. and You don't have to give a justification for God. I'm saying that God is the justification for God is the transcendental argument. And all systems ultimately are circular at their root. Yes, absolutely. Because you can never ultimately get past some final authority, right? Um, but to say that that's not an argument, as I think, I think just uh, flatly incorrect, it is an argument. It's a transcendental argument, and, and transcendental arguments are valid arguments. Now, again, one could deny that, but the, the fact that if we deny transcendental arguments leads us to absurdities, that's the reductio, right? And that would prove that, that they are valid arguments in, in a logical sense, if something leads to a reductio, right? Well, um, if, if you do this again, maybe put a tag in a in a syllogism that can be addressed, okay, maybe we can get closer to an argument. What okay. but the, is it for like the third time now, just a second ago, if you rewind, uh, you were saying that, uh, that you think there was a problem with saying, I don't know, and they don't, prov hang on. When you were talking about whether or not the absolutes had a foundation, you said, you think there's a problem with saying, I don't know, and they don't require it. Uh, I don't see any problem with saying, I don't know. I don't say it's because that's almost always the right answer. Uh, I don't see any problem with asking a question, but at no point did I say they don't require it, which is once again, you're, you're still phrasing this as it, not, and I know you weren't necessarily directing at me that you were talking in general about a, a problem. Uh, I would agree with you. Anybody who says the laws of logic don't require justification has adopted a burden of proof that I don't know how they could ever meet. And uh, certainly nobody's ever done it. Saying they don't require it is a claim saying I'm not convinced they do is not a claim that they don't. Yeah, but but you utilize the things that you say you don't know if they yes. require a justification. As a pragmatic sense, because they continue to work and you utilize the same things. The one thing you utilize that I don't, you don't utilize the laws of logic. No, no, I'm saying that when you say that you do it because it's pragmatic and it works, that's not a coherent response as to how that's that, that's not a coherent justification. Uh, just because it, something it, works, whether or not it works with how it works or why it works. No, that you, you can't know saying that something works presupposes a category of value judgments to say that this is working. This is not working. This is good. This is bad. Yes. Right. And those are metaphysical it's, beliefs and claims and truths. It's, it's truth, which is what I talked about at the very beginning. That's the only, that's the only thing that I'm presupposing here. When I talk about using the laws of logic because of pragmatic, we both use them and we are in agreement that they are the reliable method and, and, and apparently seem to be inviolate. That, that's the thing, that point we agree on. You, you are now utilizing something that I don't use, which is a God as a foundation for them. That's the point at which we disagree. And what you seem to be saying is that unless I can provide an explanation for why they work, I cannot have any reasonable um, expectation that they are in fact working. And that's a crock because 
I can, I don't need to know how my car works to know whether or not it's working. I don't need to know how uh, we got to the moon to know whether or not we actually got to the moon. And logic, the, the laws of logic are something that all of us, well, you and I at least, I'll, let's not speak for everybody on the planet, we're in agreement of what they are and that they work. And so there's no way to criticize somebody for using something that works just by saying you don't know how it works. Well, I'm not convinced, I'm not convinced that you know either. Yeah, but again, it's a very specific and different question. And I appreciate the honesty of saying that you don't know that it can be justified. And um, I want to phrase it right so I don't, I don't misstate you, that uh, you don't know that it's possible and you don't know that it can be justified. But th I think that that that's a weakness in the approach and the argumentation because as a skeptic, we you ought to be able to be asked that question. And it's not an unfair question because if yeah. if you're going, huh? I am. And the correct answer is you can ask me whatever question you want as a skeptic. And you can ask, what is your justification for why the laws of logic uh, are, seem reliable? And my answer is, I don't know, because that is the proper skeptical response. You keep, oh, as a skeptic, you must do X. And I'm sitting here telling you, no, that's not what skepticism is in the way that I and most modern skeptics would use it. Because you can ask me, what's your justification for this? And my answer is, I don't know, because if modern skepticism is about anything, and I'll talk about this in the in the Magic and Skepticism show at Dragon Con and wherever else. It is about recognizing our discomfort with saying I don't know and how that is plaguing us to make logical mistakes and make fallacious leaps because, as I pointed out before, our discomfort with not knowing when most of the time I don't know is actually the right answer. And the fact that th that answer isn't satisfying to people, it's just too damn bad if it's the right answer. The fact that it doesn't satisfy, it, it's frustrating. I know because as kids, you know, when you when you ask your parents why and they say, because I said so, that's a crappy answer. I mean, that's completely dissatisfying. That's, that's never appealing to anybody. And what I see from, from Tag and others is basically a because I said so, only the I is God. It doesn't explain anything to us. The, the God God has no explan the God concept has no explanatory power. You're solving. No, it. it absolutely does, and I've been arguing this whole time how it does. It does because that of the fact that there's a whole bunch of transcendental categories that are not material that we all presuppose that we all utilize. You talk about utilizing the concept of truth as a presupposition, but you don't know and you can't say if it's actually out there. That is a fundamental sophistry and absurdity. You can't utilize these things. You can do it, but you're doing it because the worldview of atheism is not true. That's the argument. And you could say that's not an argument, that's fine. But it is an argument, and it's a very powerful argument because all it's, of these transcendental categories are used. And to say that they're not real and it can't be justified, well. I didn't say that they weren't real and I didn't say they can't be justified. This no, is the 18th time you, you've, you've used that phrasing. It's, you, you don't even understand what skepticism is and you don't seem to understand. No, I, I know very well what skepticism is. Okay. I studied it intensely in grad school. Okay. You just, I argued. Well, I, I debated skeptical professors. I know what skepticism is, and you can keep qualifying it and saying that. Well, I just don't know. I just don't know. And I understand that in many, you know, in a sense, it's fine to take the approach of being willing to be corrected, being willing to say I don't know. But that's different than being asked about justifying claims. And a debate is about justifying beliefs and claims, is it not? Uh, well, you're making a claim which you have to justify, and I'm explaining why I don't accept it. I'm not making a... a, a, a so but you are. That's the thing that you don't understand. I, you are. not. You're absolutely... No, you are. Not. You can say I'm not, but you logically necessarily do. That's what you don't get. No, this is why I explain the difference between saying I'm convinced that you're innocent versus I'm not convinced that you're guilty. What, what claim did I make about the logical absolutes other than I am not convinced that they need a foundation? You claim that they work and you can use them, but they don't and perhaps cannot be justified. I you don't, don't, think, you don't think that's a metaphysical claim. I don't know whether or not they can be justified, but claiming that they work is something that I'm that, that you agree with. And that but is that a metaphysical truth claim in, in any sense? Is it a metaphysical? Well, under the under the presuppositions that I listed, that I'm presupposing truth and a reality and those absolutes, um, then yes, those are all entailed in there. My objection is that you are so you going to admit the entail things. That's what I'm trying to say. So, so I admit what? You admit that there's logical entailment in even saying that I use these things, but I don't know if they can be justified. There's, that's still no, no, claiming no. things about metaphysics and no. epistemology.
I'm saying they're presuppositions, which by definition are not justified. If they were justified, we wouldn't freaking presuppose them. You no, can't. that's not true. That's not that's, true. That's, that's to say that there's no such thing as a transcendental argument. That's how, what the hell is a presupposition? If, if, if we have a justification for something, we don't need to presuppose it. That's not right. That's why you don't understand what a transcendental argument is. It is a logical form of argumentation. For example, let me give an example from mathematics. I mean, you can disagree with them, but the, the, the denial of that kind of an argumentation is what leads to the uncertainty. I didn't deny it. Huh? I, I don't know. It, it, we should probably go back to some more super chat because okay. you and I are not speaking the same language at all. I didn't deny that this wasn't an argument or, or, or logical. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Midway Productions, 50 SCK. Question for Matt. Is your belief that God doesn't exist rational or determined? Is your response to this question rational or determined? When did I say? Uh, so, oh, wow, this, this is the frustrating thing. Matt, is your belief that God doesn't exist? When did I, when did I express that? Because I'm not convinced that a God, first of all, we need to define a God. What God are you talking about? Which God? Uh, because there are some gods which, by virtue of them conflicting with observations from reality, and I think we can be reasonably confident, those gods don't exist. If you say that your god uh, makes the, the sky pink 24-7, well, the sky is not pink 24-7. And so there's a conflict either with whether or not that God exists or whether or not your understanding of that God is the same thing. My position is I am not convinced that a God exists. So when you frame it as if I'm asserting that there isn't a God and then asking whether or not it's rational, um, well, it depends entirely on which God we're talking about and whether or not I do actively believe that that God doesn't exist. Yeah, I don't think that there is such a position as a skeptical neutrality that Matt would like to have. I know that in an ex existential sense, Matt takes the position of skeptical neutrality, but I don't think that he understands that even that position necessitates logical claims and metaphysical claims and claims about justifying things, whether he wants it to or not. That's what I think is the, the, the disparity here. Jay, do you believe I have $1,000 in my wallet right now? I don't know. Do you believe that I don't have $1,000 in my wallet right now? I don't believe either claim. Okay. okay, thanks for refuting your own point from a moment ago. Correct, but that's at the normative level of interactions yeah. and not and at the paradigmatic special, level. And that's See, special pleading. That's two different things. That's yeah, different that's, things. that's special pleading. No, that's, that's what I've been arguing. That's not special pleading because the whole time I've been arguing for transcendental categories and arguments, not normative logical claims. Yeah, it's called special pleading. You're claiming the transcendental arguments are special so they don't have to apply the normal argument. Uh, you just said a minute ago that they're, that they're presupposed and, they're, and that they're different. Uh, I said that they're presupposed. That's w with respect to whether or not they can be justified, not whether or not they are they are fundamentally different and whether they follow. Like if you pre everything is derived from logic once you presuppose that as the foundation. Don't you think that there's something there's that uh, if I deny the laws of logic, that's more fundamental than whether I'm wrong about uh, the thousand dollars in your pocket or little Wayne living next door to me. Isn't one of those more fundamentally yes. damaging to a worldview? Yes. Then you admit the point. That's the whole point that right. I'm making about what a transcendental is and why it's so more fundamentally paradigmatic. I agree the two things are different. I don't agree that w your explanation, I'm oh, sorry, I'm getting a time to take the trash out. I don't agree that your claim that because they're different, they're no longer subject to reason or, or, or the, the sort of epistemic warrant. The fact that we presuppose something is because we can't justify it. Currently, Maybe you're, you're offering a justification and a justification without any epistemic warrant. No, I'm not. It's not, it does have epistemic warrant. Okay. I mean, it, the epistemic warrant is the arguments I've been making for the last two hours. Uh, let's move on. So the next one is Admiral Squat Bar. He says $2. Jay scoots away from the mic and the speakers. Okay, I'm trying. Uh, John DeFranco, 10 bucks. Thank you, John. Vitaly Khmelsky, $5. His argument essentially actually proves God. Every supposition is based on Christian philosophy, whether he knows it or not. That is the transcendental argument in summation, correct? That's a bald-ass assertion. So if that's what the transcendental argument is, then congratulations, it's not an argument, it's an assertion. Well, it's a summation of what the transcendental argument is in, in a proposition, but not every proposition is, an, not every assertion is false or... Actually, it's uh, about... Not, it's so, a summation of the argument. It does require fleshing. Uh, this assertion that I'm not aware of it, the number of times today that it's been suggested that I'm just, you know, an ignorant buffoon today is rather staggering, which is why I, I've I didn't say that. Sure. Well, I, you know, I think, uh, go ahead. All right, the next one is uh, Demetrios 
or excuse me, Tanner Terry. Uh, no, we already did that one. Excuse me. Tanner Terry, Matt, you say you believe in the laws of logic having a meaningful ontological status, but you cannot tell us what the grounds are of them in our world. So how do you know that they have any ontological status? I'm not sure I understand what you mean by ontological status other than. So what we're talking about is the difference between whether something works and how how or why it works or, or the ontology of what it is, um, which I'm. I actually took some notes about this earlier because there's some confusion about whether or not these sorts of things, whether abstracts can have an ontology at all. Um, and, and it's, you know, you can conceptualize anything, but w like if you removed every mind from the universe, um, I would agree that what we point to by the descriptive laws of logic um, have not vanished. You know, something still is what it is or isn't what it isn't. And that I can't demonstrate that and nobody ever could because we couldn't be there in a universe without a mind. But this is this is what is implied by accepting them. Now, whether or not they have an ontology unto themselves of some sort of characteristic, I don't think that that's necessarily the case. I think that the language you use to describe these, for me, identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle are summed up easiest in a simple Venn diagram with a single circle. And everything is either in the circle or not in the circle. Um, and that's it. And, and so these are, the, these are the sorts of ways that we demonstrate the truth under the assumption of truth of these things, but I don't think they're out there, like there's not, they're not prescriptive, X must be the case. I think they're just the way things are and they're not something that exists unto themselves. And so I don't think they could have an ontology in that sense, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I think that this would be another weakness in that argument, which is that this question is specifically about the ontological status of those things and the argument that i've been giving is dealing with proving the ontological status of those types of things now matt is free to disagree with that and not accept the argumentation but i think what he's missed is that a transcendental argument is a different type of argument and that doesn't mean that it's not an argument but it's a different type of argument so and it is a little counterintuitive to the way that we do normative logical uh, Venn diagrams, as he mentioned, because it's a meta question. So one could theoretically say, I'm not interested and I don't accept or I don't want meta level questions to be asked or dealt with. But I don't think that that's a, that, that, that I mean, I'm not saying Matt's necessarily doing that. Matt says he's open to any questions. But if we take the route of saying that I'm not going to accept transcendental arguments as valid arguments, then I think that leads us to very absurd conclusions. It leads us to reductios and reductios are fallacies. So, uh, yeah, I'm open to any questions, just as long as the person who's asking the questions doesn't rule out potential answers like I don't know. And you've once again said this is a weakness. You think this is a weakness of the argument. What argument is a weakness of? Yeah, saying I don't know is not an, an argument, and that's cool. fine that you don't want it to be an and, argument, right? It be a weakness but of that's, argument. But that's, what, but that's what debates are. And so when I give argumentation, oh. you're, you're essentially saying that presuppositions, transcendentals can't be justified. You said they can't, but you said that we don't justify them, we assume them. That's not true. They can be justified. So you are making arguments. I did. Uh, I'm not aware of any way in which they can be justified or if they need a justification. You are convinced that they do need a justification and that you have the justification. But when you start talking about what debates are, debates are not one side shows up and says X is true and the other side shows up and says X is not true or X is false. You don't have to have both two different people asserting something. What That's you can have is- debate. Yeah, there's a affirmation and negation. That's classic debate. Okay, well, I don't give a rat's ass about classic debate. Because okay. you can still have a debate where one person presents their evidence for their claim and the other person points out flaws in the evidence for the claim. It's not a demonstration that they're wrong. It's a demonstration that they are not warranted in saying that they're correct. And you still have a debate there, right? Yeah, and that can still be formulated as an affirmation and negation because I can ask you, I mean, unless you don't want to deal with those kinds of questions, and that's fine if you don't want to, but there's nothing wrong with asking those questions back to you and pointing out that to say that something is, um, I don't know that it's provable, that still necessitates and implicates you in pre, uh, uh, metaphysical and epistemic claims, even if you don't want it to. It doesn't. Yes, it does. That's what you don't understand. And that's why you don't understand that a transcendental <laughs> argument is a logical argument and it's valid. Keep, it's going to be fun. 
All right, next up, Torpedo Fish, $5. Atheist empiricism provides no epistemic justification for universals, but theism does. Therefore, theism has more explanatory power of reality. I would say, I would phrase it different, but not more explanatory power, but it does have the explanatory power, correct? Yeah, and skeptical positioning of not being aware of whether or not you cheated does not have the explanatory power of being convinced that I cheated, and neither of them demonstrate whether or not I cheated. I can do this. Yeah, all the analogy is a false analogy because it assumes that normative, epistemic, logical claims are the same as paradigmatic claims, and they're not. That's what you don't understand. Justin Stam, 10 bucks. Excellent display of logic of atheist presuppositions, but again, we see outside the format of a controlled setting in a university, a atheists lose the argumentation. I'm, cool. sure Matt would, I'm sure Matt would disagree with that. <laughs> Randy Churchill, 20 bucks. Thank you, Randy. Orthodox Pilgrim, 50 bucks. Matt Dillahoney, why do so many atheists go after Christians and not other religious beliefs? Is there something about Christianity that is infuriating to atheists? Look at Orthodox Christianity. It is a better, it is better than watered down Southern Baptist views. Why do so many atheists go after Christianity? Well, I do a call in show, so I take whatever God claims people present when they call in. And when I'm doing debates, I debate whatever they're actually presenting. Um, if you're an English-speaking person somewhere in the West, probably the reason you see atheists going after, especially in the United States, why you would see atheists going after Christians uh, and, and versions of Christianity more often is because that's the predominant religion that has a privileged position that the most people adhere to in some sense. Um, it would make, I mean, I've, I've gone after Scientology, Islam, uh, you name it. Uh, but the it's kind of like saying if where you live, 75 percent of people are dying from cancer. Why aren't you guys studying athletes foot? Now, is is Chris, is Christianity the biggest religious problem worldwide? No. And actually, what I go after isn't necessarily Christianity, unless that's what the person's presenting or whatever version of theirs is. My my thing here is is to constantly go after whether or not a belief's warranted. And this is where one of the confusions, or in Jay's case, I just don't understand. You I'm not when you show up and say, I'm convinced God exists for these reasons. My my response is not, you're wrong, God doesn't exist. It's, you're wrong, those reasons don't provide the evidentiary warrant that you think it does. I'm not challenging your conclusion, I'm challenging your argument and evidence. And if I'm not presented with an argument and evidence, if I'm just presented with assertions, then we just keep going back and forth. And this is why when people say, oh, well, you're saying this. No, I'm actually not saying that. And it, it happens all the time. Yes, and I understand what you're saying there, Matt. It's just that the claim for the transcendental argument is different than most argumentation. It's a different type of argument, and it's an analysis of two different paradigms. So one can say, I don't want to do that, and that's fine, but that's part of my argument. My argument necessitates doing that as well. So that's why it's unique. And, and it's unique because transcendental categories and preconditions themselves are unique. They're a different type of argument. Let me give you one example. Gerdell, Gerdell famously did this type of argument with mathematics when he argues with Bertrand Russell over set theory and he does the, the incompleteness theorems. That's a mathematical form of a transcendental argument. So one could theoretically say that it's not valid or they don't accept it, but we use it in mathematics. It actually does come into play in different disciplines. So I think they're valid argumentation. And, and I would say that if one is, is at the, I'm not saying you're saying this, but if one is at the point of saying that, uh, they're not justifiable. They can't be justified. I don't see why they would be justified. I think that that is not a solid critique, not a solid response to the argument itself. And my concern isn't whether or not the argument is valid as so much as whether or not it's sound. And if I'm not presented with something, some sort of syllogistic form, I can't even, in a, in a, in a conversational thing, it is almost impossible the way we speak and communicate to say, that's an invalid argument because validity goes to the structure. And in a colloquial sense, when we're using shorthand and we haven't actually put things in premises, it's really hard. It, you can easily hide whether or not a structure is valid or not. And that's why we prefer to do things in syllogistic form. It's also the reason that when we're evaluating a claim in propositional logic, there's a proposition and not two propositions. We, we, we evaluate a single proposition. That's how you get a reductio. Premise one is the, the thing that you're potentially going to show is absurd. It's not Premise one is this, premise two is the opposite of, you would, right. that's, that's the reason we do logic the way we do. 
yeah, and that's almost always true, except in the cases where we're asking questions of metalogic. And the whole argument about transcendental arguments is a metalogical question. So you can say that we don't want to go there, but I'm going there, and, that, and that's what the argument is. It's a question of metalogic. All right, next up is a, a doorman, 20 bucks. Assuming the skeptics that preceded us weren't interested in truth displays a bit of conceit and bad faith, especially when they tackled metaphysical questions so profound that it threatened to destroy their own worldview. I don't, I'm not saying that uh, Hume or even Kant or it, people who were skeptical, I mean, Kant was convinced of Hume's argumentation. I'm not saying that, uh, that they're in uh, bad faith. I'm saying that they were consistent and they led, Hume went to a certain degree of skepticism where he admitted a lot of things that most skeptics, maybe not with Matt, but most skeptics won't admit. For example, Hume says there's no basis for causality. There's no basis to, you're not observing causal relations, you're observing event A, event B, they're discrete operations, events, and you're just calling them causality. Um, I think that causality is real. I think it's a transcendental category, just like telos and the other things that I've listed. Um, the question about meta, issues is can they be justified and one can say i don't think so i don't know mass position um i think they can i think because they point us to god is why it's such a strong argument and again yeah. matt i understand matt doesn't not sure that, the way that was phrased i'm not sure that was directed at you or me but if i gave him the impression that i that skeptics don't care about truth uh, that's that's not remotely what i'm talking about there is the question of uh do we have access to truth? And, you know, the it, solipsism and all the other little things we talked about play into whether or not we actually have access to truth. And so when I look at the world, um, I'm not, I don't make proclamations about absolute certainty or truth in anything other than um, a, a kind of compatible, or not compatible, but I, think I don't want to go down and get people confused on free will. Um, so, if I roll a die and it comes up a four, I can look at that and I can say, ah, it's true that that die is rolled a four. And if 99% of the population agree with me, now I've got this independent confirmation that we rely on, you know, for testing epistemic claims and stuff like that. But the fact that there's 1% of the population that points to that die and says, no, 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 it's true that it's the die rolled a 17 uh, doesn't mean that we're in, on any sort of shaky ground in, in what we're, we're talking about. But that is truth that, kind of this level and the question is oh how do you know that your you know your reality your experience of reality is true how do you know that the reality that you think you experience is actually the true reality and i don't know that there's any solution to those problems and so rather than pretending that there is i'm just going to say wow that's an incredibly intriguing you know question that philosophers have toiled over for ages and i'm not convinced that anybody's come up with the right answer yet uh, Benny Red Pill, five Canadian. Matt, would you? Why do you refuse to debate to debate Skeptico? He has an empirical, he has empirical data that destroys materialistic dogma. I don't know that I'm aware of who Skeptico is or whether I've ever refused to debate. I don't. Um, where where did you hear that I refuse to debate? I'll tell you who I've refused to debate. I won't debate Sai again. And I won't debate Ray Comfort again, even though I've debated both of them, uh, because Ray has expressed that he's not interested in debate. He just wants to come on and witness. Uh, and, you know, OK, if you're not going to present an argument and you just want to tell me that Jesus loves me, cool, you can do that anytime. And it's not a debate. And Sai is a genuinely terrible person who mistreated somebody who was a friend of mine. Um, apart from that, I don't know if there's anybody who I've refused to debate. You could probably you can find some people who refuse to debate me like Bill Craig, but I, I take pretty much any debate somebody wants to do. So I don't know who this skeptico is or anything. Maybe I do. Maybe in the course of the years, once upon a time, I knew who it was. I don't know. Uh, I debate a skeptico. You can find my debate with him. It's pretty amusing if anybody wants some entertainment. But Demetrios Klados, 20. Jay, as a scientist and orthodox, I stopped debating with an atheist a while back. Now I just pray for them. However, I appreciate watching your attempt to reason with spiritually dead and the unreasonable. God bless. Well, that's, uh, thank you. I'm getting that um, on spiritually dead and unreasonable. That's getting on a t-shirt. Uh, I'm not going to read the next one, foregone. That's uh, I'm not going to read any rude comments. Tanner Terry, five bucks. To both debaters, how does your worldview deal with ground types and classes of things? I don't know what ground types are. Well, that's two of us that don't know. 
classes of things, if you mean like Aristotle's classes of kingdom, phylum, I mean, I don't have any problem admitting the reality of, of classes of things. So Franklin Chan, 999, thank you for all your work. We do a lot of categorizing, which we've done in here. There's a difference between something that's physical and something that's abstract, something that's, you know, you don't want to confuse the map for the place sort of thing. So we can put things in, ca if that's what you're talking about, um, I don't know how much time I spend doing that. Franklin Chan, uh, 10 bucks. Thanks for all the work, you guys. Hans Lager, five bucks. Support for Jay. Thank you, Fran. Uh, Hans. Hans Lager. Michael Flaherty, $150. Matt, you have been a gentleman and the best that we've seen with Jay. Uh, let's get off of the internet and onto a stage with your buddy Sam Harris. Uh, I guess, are you saying me or are you saying Matt? Matt's been on stage with must, Sam Harris. Must be you. I've done quite a few events with Sam now. Yeah, I would uh, always, I don't, I don't turn down debates either. I'm, I'm a, like Matt, I'm a debate hound. So I would say yes to most debates. Seraphim S, $5. Matt said that we should follow laws of logic. Uh, this is an ethical claim. Why should we follow the laws of logic in his worldview since this is a question of meta ethics? Well, I don't recall, I don't recall making a statement that we ought to, but, or at least not in the context that you're saying, but. Uh, you know, I talked about it being, a, this is useful, It's it, it provides truth. There's a presupposition in order to say that you ought to follow the laws of logic, and that is that you ought to do the thing, well, it becomes circular right then, because you ought to care about the truth and you ought to work to be consistent with that. Um, any argument that I make for why we should care about the laws of logic necessarily depends upon them. You can't have any sort of argument or reason without beginning to assume them. And the fact that we must do that even this is why this is why i'm convinced uh, to the highest confidence that i can that they're absolute is that you would have to assume that they're true to try to demonstrate that they're not true and my thing isn't so logic tells you nothing logic itself tells you nothing about the facts of reality it is the tool that we use to then categorize things to say this is a and this is not a i mean that's that's the nuts and bolts of it why should we do that um, I would argue that the evidence shows that remaining consistent with logic and constructing logical arguments makes you avoid being wrong or limiting your risk of being wrong. And that if you stopped doing that, if you tossed out the laws of logic, um, you would be dead. The world would descend into chaos, as, as Jay was pointing out earlier, that this, this is not only absurdity, but as, as I would say, it's incredibly dangerous. But now you're at, a, you're at a point where the question becomes, oh, well, what makes you think I need to care about whether or not I keep living? Well, that's entirely up to you as to whether or not you want to keep living. Um, but if you toss the laws of logic out, I think you probably will find out you're probably not going to live that long. Okay, uh, yeah, I would, uh, the one point where I would disagree with Matt there is the claim that the laws of logic don't tell us anything about the reality or the real world. Um, I think that they do, and I think that the meta-level questions and math-related questions, uh, questions that relate to engineering, those kinds of things, they actually do teach us and tell us things about the world, especially when we actually go and test them. Taylor Terry, five bucks. To both, do we know when something is convincing or has been properly demonstrated? Is there some standard... And if not, can anything be convincing? I would say that we have to assume that there is some intuitive sense that humans are so constituted such that they can recognize when something is coherent, when something is demonstra demonstrated and demonstrable, uh, and they can recognize those standards. So it would be another one of those kind of things that, that are assumed in the process of learning, the process of science, the process of truth and mathematics. So um, the coherence between propositions and truths, between words and concepts, meanings, et cetera, um, that would be another transcendental category that would be assumed in the process and something that I don't think you could empirically justify, but just because something's not empirically justifiable, in my view, does not mean that it can't be argued for or justified, hence the meta questions. This, this, is, this is the whole reason that there's a debate, is kind of what you're asking is, what quality and quantity of evidence should be convinced should be sufficient to, to know that you have a warranted belief, and as Sagan and others pointed out, you know, or Hume proportion your confidence to the evidence, and uh, Sagan would point out that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The answer to your question is incredibly complicated, but the shortest version is each claim is going to have its own bar, 
and the quality and quantity of evidence would have to rise above that bar for that claim. The sort of evidence I would need to to believe that you just got a new puppy is different from the sort of evidence that might convince me you just got a Bugatti Veyron, or even worse, you have a pet unicorn. Those those three claims are of a slightly different nature. But at the end of the day, and this is the the terrible, dirty secret, it's up to each individual. You're you're not in control of your beliefs. You're not in control. You you are either convinced or you're not. And for many people, there are roadblocks with regard to biases and other things that are hidden that you may not see. And for others, they may be far more open. I mean, there are people we know who are gullible and easily convinced of things, or we would describe it that way. Doesn't mean they're wrong, but they can be easily convinced. And so, no, there's not any, pick any claim. There's not a set standard of when we have this much evidence of this type, now we're on firm ground, which is why we've always had these arguments and debates about how much and what quality of evidence is enough. And what Jay thinks is enough to warrant belief is fundamentally different than I do on some things. And yet we would probably agree on lots of other things. Yeah, the one thing I would say about the argument that Matt just gave itself is a form of a universal claim. Um, it is a statement about a universal state of affairs that relates to what is universally the case about how we can and can't know and what we can and can't prove. And I would say that that itself is um, inconsistent with a pragmatic empiricism. But I don't know, we may not want to go down that route. I don't know. Um, Anthony Magnabosco, two dollars. Who is making the most presuppositions? I would say we both make all the same presuppositions uh, because the you trans didn't make you presuppose God, and I don't. So clearly, that's not true. Well, that's true. In the case of the normal transcendental categories of the past, the self, laws, laws of logic, numbers, um, that's what I mean. We all have the same presuppositions. I think that those meta questions are solved by a god who's a metaphysical being it's a meta question to talk about god meta metaphysics and meta ethics and meta logic are very similar in the way that they're demonstrated and of course one can refuse that but i think it's a valid argument and that's what i've been trying to present I, I find it kind of strange because I would expect you to say that you make exactly one presupposition, and that's God, and everything else is derived from that. Because when you use God as a foundation, you're no longer presupposing logic. You, you are presupposing the foundation for logic. No, I mean, I wouldn't say that those things are either or. I mean, I, I believe in all of those categories that we've talked about. I think they're, ver they're very real, and I think that they have a logical justification. And that's what a transcendental argument is, is a form of logic. It's a logical uh, uh, argument. It's a logical, uh, it's a different type of logic, but it is a logical argument. Now yeah. one could, again, one could disagree with that and not accept that, but I think I'm that genuinely, I'm genuinely trying to understand this. I presuppose the laws of logic. Would you say that you presuppose the laws of logic? Sure. And yet you think you have a foundation for those, which means that Correct. no supposition is required. If I have, no, no that's not, not the argument. The argument is not that a presupposition doesn't require a justification. Wow. That, so there's a word that perhaps I've been wrong about my entire life. A thing tacitly assumed beforehand at the beginning of a line of argument or course of action. The action or state of presupposing or being proposed. When I look at a presupposition, when, when people talk about what they're presupposing, if you have an explanation for something, then I'm not presupposing it. It is derived from that explanation. I, I could, Because then I could just argue... Um, well, I, I presuppose that I did not spontaneously come into existence because my parents had sex and I share genetic traits with them. Now, I don't presuppose that I, just pop, that I didn't just pop into existence. I'm convinced of that for an actual reason. Now, I might presuppose that my parents had sex and, that, and the evidence shows I share genetics, but to me, a presupposition is something for which you, you presuppose it because you don't have an evidentiary or foundational warrant behind it. Because if you do, it's no longer presupp presupposition. It is derived from that. It's no, that's why I was saying that different things are proven in different ways. So the way that we would go about proving things that relate to the natural world, what, what temperature does water boil, the way that we prove that is different than the way that we prove things that are fundamentally different in nature. Now, one could say that I don't accept anything that's not material, but if I believe in things that are immaterial, it 
stands to reason that the way that I, I would prove them would be different than the way that I prove the material things, because the thing that we're talking about is immaterial. It's invariant. It's conceptual. It's not going to be proven in the same way that things that are material are proven. Hence well, I, the transcendental argumentation and transcendental arguments are arguments. That's the whole point. Now, again, you could say, I don't accept transcendental arguments. They're not valid arguments. And the why response you, to I don't know why you keep going there. I've never said it's not valid. I didn't say I'm not going to accept transcendental arguments. I'm talking. So this is only this little subtext is only about presuppositions. Um, it doesn't matter that it's abstract. I don't presuppose love. Well, that's, I mean, you could say that, but, but again, all I'm trying to say is that, that this is a branch of logic and it's a branch of argumentation that deals with justifying presuppositions and, and preconditions for things. Now, again, maybe you're not saying that you don't accept them. I don't understand that you're saying that they make sense in a logical way, but I'm saying it's not wrong to ask the meta level, meta logic question of can they be justified and how do we make sense of them? In fact, it's, the said, it's why are you talking about the exact, it, this has nothing to do with what we're actually talking about. It's my argument. You're saying that, that I'm arguing for a thing that's immaterial and invariant. I'm talking about what is a presupposition and whether or not it's justified. So I could say I presuppose logic, but here's the reason why I think logic is real. And here's my evidence for the thing I think is the, sorry, uh, love. Uh, here's, you know, if I then provide a foundation for it, I'm no longer presupposing it. It is now a warranted position based on my argument. That's not I, what presuppositions are. Presuppositions are not things for which you have no warrant. They're different types of arguments and different types of things. They're okay. just proven in a different way. That's all we're well, saying. Then, then a good chunk of this is going to be uh, incredibly confusing because we mean two entirely different things by presuppositions. For me, when I say I presuppose something, this is something that I am convinced is true, um, but I cannot justify. And I'm not convinced anybody else can justify, or I would have a justification and I would no longer presuppose it. And I don't ever say I presuppose love or any other abstract. And so I don't know what the justification is for saying, oh, I presuppose something, but here's, here's its evidential warrant. Right, so... Evidences can be given and proven or, or demonstrated for different types of things in different ways. Again, the way that we would do a courtroom drama and settle a dispute over uh, who was murdered so-and-so, did Bill Cosby do X, Y, Z? That's different than the way that we would solve a, an abstract, complex math problem, right? Two different types of things, two different types of arguments. One is more abstract, more a priori, more immaterial and invariant in its nature. The other one is more solid, empirical, physical, right? But that doesn't mean that what we're arguing for in, a, in terms of transcendental categories aren't arguable and aren't provable and aren't, it's just that they're proven in a different type of way. So for example, and I know that Dr. Malpass disagrees, but um, actually, and, and I'll make one last point about this, this transcendental and we'll move on. But um, if you look at John Damascus, a famous uh, eighth century Christian theologian, he wrote a book called Fount of Knowledge. And he looked back at Aristotle I'm not saying that's true because Aristotle said, I'm just giving an example from Aristotle. Um, Aristotle argued with the sophists, and the sophists said that if we deny the law of non-contradiction, um, you, you can't prove that, Aristotle. What if I come along and I deny the law of non-contradiction? Aristotle res responds with a transcendental argument, and John Damascus backs this up, and I hope that Dr. Malpass is watching because that's the response to his last essay that he wrote about me. But uh, uh, he saw John, Dam uh, John Damascus saw Aristotle as giving a transcendental argument. And the argument is that when you uh, deny something that's fundamental and paradigmatic, the proof for that thing is in the fact that it's assumed in its denial. That is a, a transcendental argument. That's It's that simple. And it is a positive proof. It's just a different type of proof than normal em empirical claims or even normal logical claims. And that's why, because the nature of the thing is unique due to its paradigmatic uh, level. The three of you on stage, public forum. Uh, can Jordan come? Michael Flaherty. Uh, that's out of my out of my range. That's not up to me. Um, I can't read Arabic. Uh, Two dollars. Matt, would you debate Steve McRae? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, no, because Steve. Uh, Zach. <laughs> Zach, Two dollars. Get it going. J uh, Jordan Peterson, Dyer, Harris. Uh, yeah, we're not going to read any insults. Uh, Mr. Antarctica, 20 or $1. Thank you. Nemo, Utopian, $2. Jay, does God generate logic or obey it? Uh, that's actually one quick thing I did want to touch on, which was, um, if you know the, like the transcendental argument for the non-existence of God from Michael Martin Tang, 
Um, what this does is that it basically says that it assumes that the laws of logic are arbitrary categories that God sort of uh, can change or or uh, play with at will or whatever. We wouldn't say that. We would say that the laws of logic, truth, et cetera, are reflections of, of God, the reflections of the divine mind. So no, God does not change the laws of logic, and that's not a denial of his omnipotence, because within our paradigm, within our worldview, the, the meaning of omnipotence would be determined by the highest absolute metaphysical category within the worldview, which is God himself. So omnipotence is not determined by the guy who says, well, I think omnipotence must mean that you can make truth into a lie. Uh, we would reject that whole that whole definition of what uh, omnipotence is. So that's why we don't believe in the Tang view. Um, Tanner Terry, $5. Matt, would you agree that meta-level discourse deals with justifying presuppositions or while normative-level discourse does not? I don't know. I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm getting the echo thing again. Um, meta-level discussions are about understanding and, and attempting to justify whatever the normative level is. I mean, that, that's the whole thing. Of, you know. or, or the meta level themselves. Okay. Lucid Locomotive 199. Thank you, uh, Mr. Antarctica. Oh, we read that one. All right. Well, um, wait. Matt, Catholicism, Orthodox. Matt, is Catholicism, or, I don't know why, I mean, I, I, this doesn't make any sense. Matt, is Catholicism or Orthodoxy more biblical or Protestantism? Um, well, I would, I would argue, first of all, it depends on which Bible you're going to point to. Um, I, think, I think the easiest way for me to do this, and yes, I was a Southern Baptist, but I've also debated Orthodox and, and Catholics as well. Uh, Catholics have extra books. That don't exist in the Protestant Bible. So if you're going to say which one's more biblical, then it depends on which books you're going to include in your, you know, your liturgy there to, to say, oh, this is what it's based on. Um, I think there are Catholic beliefs that fly in the face of what is in, of course, the Protestant Bible. Um, I think they've added to it. Uh, whether or not that's justified or whatever, I don't know. It's, uh, I, I remember growing up as a Baptist, we were taught that the Catholics were Mary worshiping, idol worshiping heretics who probably weren't going to heaven, but that was obviously a Protestant view. And so one of the things is that a cult is, uh, or, or the, it's the religion that's not yours and perhaps not as popular. And so there's been this constant conflict between, you know, Protestants and Catholics and, and, uh, I can't tell you which one is more biblical until we know what the Bible is and what it's supposed to be, because, you know, I, I would argue that the fact that there's a thousand or more denominations that all identify as Christian and disagree on every single point of doctrine is probably one of the many potential death knells for Christianity in general. But then now we're into an argument basically from divine hiddenness, and that's outside the scope of this. Uh, well, I would definitely say orthodoxy is more biblical, and like Matt, I was raised Baptist, so I can uh, definitely understand Matt uh, in terms of where he's coming from. Super Chad, and, 10 bucks. To be fair, I'm not as familiar, despite having debated orthodox people before, I'm not as familiar with orthodox doctrine and how it, how it differentiates from uh, Protestantism or Catholicism, um, so I'm not the right guy to ask. Super Chad, 10 bucks. Matt, if you're a materialist, what makes you believe that your brain's neural firings have anything to do with truth on a metaphysical level? I don't think I claim that. Mr. Antarctica, two NZs. J, without God is knowledge impossible. If by knowledge you mean um, justified true belief or giving a coherent account for our beliefs. Um, yes, I believe that it would lead to uh, absurdity, and ultimately that's kind of what the, the argument is in summation. Um, that's all the Super Chats. Great debate. Two and a half hours. Thank you very much, Matt. I uh, appreciate that. I've got, I've got Matt's uh, uh, link there if anybody wants to check out his channel there in the description. And uh, uh, a gentleman, a scholar, thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Um, Oh, I'm getting the echo. Nope. Oh, uh, yeah, I just want to say thanks, and we'll get this posted, and I'm sure we'll both get feedback from lots of people, and I'm sure I'll be pointed out, oh, you should have said this, or you didn't say this, or you were wrong here, or whatever else, and that's 
honestly, one of the biggest reasons I do this, when I talked about before how I didn't walk in here with any notion that I'm likely to change Jay's mind um, about the big issues, there's also this notion that, you know, I perhaps might change Jay's mind on some other issue or that Jay might change my mind or by having the discussion, somebody else might change both of our minds. And so I like the discussions. Um, I, I just, I, I kind of wish... Every single time, and there are people who I know are very frustrated with debates. I mean, I, I do people call into the show all the time. I have my Atheist Debates channel. I talk about debates and debating and everything else. I know there are people who are frustrated because they don't think any good comes of any of this. And despite that, I have a number of friends who agree and disagree about the God thing, who engage in conversations. And I have thousands upon thousands of emails from people who have benefited from those conversations. A good chunk of them have found their way out of one particular religious belief or another or gained a better understanding of skepticism. And a few of them have just said, you know what, uh, I listened to you and I walked away more confident and firm in my beliefs than ever. And uh, while I don't know, you know, I, I'm thankful that they at least listened and considered because I think that's probably more than most people do in their lifetime. I know that one of the reasons it took me forever to to kind of find my way out of, of Christianity is because there was no reason to consider it. Everybody around me believed and it made sense. And like I was saying with Jay at the outset, yeah, if you want to be confident that logic is reliable then being convinced that there's a God who guarantees that logic is inviolate, um, that's very satisfying. And it may be exactly the sort of thing that somebody needs to be comfortable continuing to use logic. I don't need that extra step because I haven't seen a demonstration that it's necessary. Um, and I'm pretty much convinced that while Jay and I agree that laws of logic are absolute and viable or, or and violated or, or as close to that as possible. Um, I'm not convinced that there is an explanation or, or that there needs to be one, but I'm open to the possibility that it might be. Uh, last couple of ones, Grom Beard. Uh, thank you, Matt and Jay for courageously expressing beliefs. I enjoyed the debate. I hope you get back together for another session. Super curious Two twenty nine. 29. What method do you use to determine truth? I think we've, we've talked about that the whole time. So, uh, he just said, you know, Matt just gave a good description of, of areas where we'd agree in terms of uh, laws of logic. Uh, Mr. Antarctica, again, are, aren't certain things self-evident. I don't believe in self-evident maxims in terms of uh, foundationalism. Um, Matt has a question on that. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. I thought you were done there. Uh, no, the question on that, what's your view on properly basic beliefs? Because that, that to me feels a lot like self-evident, but I wanted to check. Yeah, no, I would say that that's pretty much um, the the main attempt of fa classical foundationalism to justify how they don't fall into a, a circular um, regress is that they'll say that there are, are beliefs that are just properly basic. Um, I don't find that to be a, a, a coherent answer when in the history of philosophy people actually, especially after Descartes, they really started trying to question things at a, at the most fundamental level. So if you read the meditations, um, you know, Descartes looking for a way to find that certainty that we've been kind of talking about. Is it possible? And he questions everything down to what he thinks is the most basic thing. But, and I would agree with, with Bertrand Russell on this, that, that the very thing that, that Descartes thinks is the most foundationally basic thing to doubt his own existence and his own consciousness, he actually doesn't go deep enough. All right. So he says, I, uh, uh, uh I think, therefore, I am, and I think Russell is actually correct to point out that that's that was logically uh, a non sequitur because all Descartes' claim shows is that thinking is occurring. Uh, I think that's true, and as many philosophers afterwards have pointed out, Descartes didn't think yet to doubt things like language, like words having meaning, and that's yeah. because that comes later in the in the the discourse of Western philosophy after uh, Jean Baptiste Vico and people start doubting linguistic philosophy, which all I think is great, and that actually led people into doing transcendental argumentation. P.F. Strauss and people like this have done uh, a lot of transcendental argumentation in relation, in relation to to, uh, to language. So I would say that, no, I don't think the properly basic beliefs can be coherently made sense of outside. That's why that's one of the reasons why coherentism is, I think, a better view of truth um, than classical foundationalism is because 
in my view, just saying that some beliefs are properly basic is just another restatement of, of circularity in the classical foundationalist paradigm. See, that's incredibly interesting that, that after two and a half hours we get to this because I think you and I are pretty much in agreement on that. I've, a matter of fact, even a week or so ago on the show, somebody called in to ask me about properly basic beliefs, and I gave a, a kind of quick glib answer that I think it is a, a, a way to obfuscate that there isn't a justification to just assert that, that we don't need one. Um, Although I'd be interested in, in uh, you know, Russell, you, you were referencing Russell pointing out the problem with Descartes, but I thought it was Hobbes that pointed out that that Descartes' cogito was contingent on logic and therefore was not, uh, you know, I used to I used to say, well, Descartes, you know, got all kinds of stuff wrong, but at least he got the one thing right. And then I find out, you know, after, I think it was Hobbes, um, that he didn't even actually get that one right, that it's basically, you know, I think therefore I am doesn't actually demonstrate the thing. Right. It does. Yeah, well, I agree with that. And you, you may be right that it could have been Hobbes before Russell that, that made that point. Um, co yeah, so that next question is about Descartes Cogito. We just covered that. Come pillow. <laughs> I'm not going to. Right, so, yeah. Uh, good debate from all sides. Thank you for that uh, dirty name, you filthy name. Nemo Utopian, 10 bucks. How does God explain the laws of logic if it's simply if it is simply the fact that God exists? and has a logical nature that makes laws sound descriptive of God and it fails to explain why he's logical. Actually, I would agree with you, Nemo Utopian, and that's one of the reasons why Orthodox theology is unique. It's because we believe in the essence energy distinction. So we would not say that the laws of logic are descriptors of the divine nature. They would be descriptors of the energies, the actions, uh, the logi, as I mentioned at the beginning from St. Maximus. So you actually are on to a good point there, Nemo, that we don't believe that they literally describe the divine nature. That would be the Western doctrine of divine simplicity. Uh, Mitchell Day, $2. Congrats on winning Matt. I guess that's up for the well, audience to decide. Maybe if this is really bad English, what they mean by winning Matt is you beating Matt. So Could go either way. I guess uh, yeah, we don't know what... I don't know what Mitchell... <laughs> I don't know what Mitchell's uh, view is, but uh, the ambiguity of that language there is is, is great. It's, uh, doormat. it's funny for me because legitimately, I've said this a m bunch of times, and, and I know that there's people who don't believe it, but there's people who don't believe that I don't believe in God, and they assert all the time, oh, no, 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 you really know there's a, you know, there's a God and you're denying it. And I'm just like, uh, every time you say that, you demonstrate to me conclusively that you're far more about projection and telling me who you are. And so this, this notion... Um, Oh, and I just completely lost track of, of what what he'd said. Um, crap, never mind. Or I'll come back whenever. <laughs> Dorm, Doorman360, best debate on the channel. Good job. Thank you. Um, Hans Laga, five bucks. Uh, Matt, you're a good sport. Thank you for coming on. Uh, Mr. Antarctica, uh, Mr. Antarctica, again, is God self-evident? Um, in a sense, yes. Um, if you mean by self-evident, <laughs> classical foundationalism, no. Um, all right. I don't see any more super chats. Great night. Uh, I don't want to keep Matt too long. Thank you for coming on, Matt. And uh, maybe in the future we can have another chat on some philosophy topics if you want yeah, to. And, and not necessarily in debate format because, I mean, if there, yeah. there are certainly curiosities about uh, orthodox theology uh, that I have more than a passing interest. That One of the first, if not the first, public debate I did live in front of a big audience was against uh, Father Hans Jacobsy, uh, who's an orthodox priest. Um, about morality. And while everybody's welcome to go watch that so that they don't just trust my assessment, it was one of the most curious debates ever because it was about whether or not you can have, whether or not morality can be grounded uh, through secular foundations. And the curious thing was that he agreed with me through the entire debate that you can reach correct moral conclusions through entirely secular means. And then in his closing remarks, he, it, it's like a Jekyll and Hyde moment. He stops agreeing with me and stops talking about how he'd go out and have a beer with me or whatever else. And he says that secularism necessarily lead, leads to Nazis and gulags and then went on a rant about pornography. And I was like, how could we agree for this whole thing to where, it, oh, that's, that gets to the point that I was talking about. I genuinely don't look at debates as a win-lose. Um, it's, it, it, this is about promoting the conversation. I didn't come here, I know people, 
they're like, oh, you're doing a debate today. Ah, oh, go kick that Thea's ass or show Jay who's boss. And I'm like, you've missed the point of why I do what I do. Um, and, and I get it. It's because there are people who aren't versed in the topics at all who call into the show and they wind up embarrassing themselves. I don't set out to embarrass anybody. I, you know, you didn't mention him by name, but one of the other presuppositionalists um, that you I'm pretty sure I know who you alluded to who didn't do a particularly good job. Or maybe it's two. I don't know. Did, yeah, it would be both. I think they're both. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm actually still like we're talking about Seitenberg and Kate and Matt Slick. Um, so I won't have anything to do with. And and as far as I can tell, he's just like parroting Greg Bonson and doesn't even necessarily understand the points that he's parroting. But Matt, I think Matt actually contacted me not too long ago because he was going to be in Austin. Um, and we're at least friendly. Uh, once we're friends, but he's going to, he likes tequila and he wants to come over and have some tequila. Uh, the quality of somebody's arguments or argumentation is independent from who, who they are as a person. And whether or not I found something convincing or compelling is independent from whether or not somebody else will. Uh, cause I'm not asserting that I'm necessarily right all the time. And so I do the debates for me, for the people that watch them. And I don't walk in going, ah, I'm going to show Jay, I'm going to smack him around. And right. That, that, that this isn't WWE. This is us people, humans thinking and trying to figure out why we disagree and where. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Uh, blood sports was, was, uh, a passing thing that was, uh, fun in a way, but, uh, yeah, I think we want to move past the the, the blood sports stuff. And uh, one last question. All right, we can't do this all night. Uh, Super Chad, ten bucks. Jay, you can see that all worldviews are uh, ultimately yes circular, but doesn't a historically confirmed arc of prophecy go above and beyond a mere internal coherence, circularity of logic and supra rationality? No. I would say that um, the biblical argument from prophecy is a strong argument, but it's only strong if you believe in the possibility of prophecy. So it would kind of be governed by our presuppositions, whether we would accept that. That's why you don't see me do like the the argument about, oh, look, Jesus rose from the dead because after he rose from the dead, uh, the apostles went from being Freddy cats to being very bold. Therefore, that proves the resurrection. That's not a good argument. Um, I don't do the Thomistic arguments uh, of the five ways because I don't think they're good, solid arguments. So in the same way, I don't think that I believe that that there are many strong arguments from prophecy when it comes to Scripture, especially Daniel 9, you know, predicting a specific empire under which uh, Jesus would be born. And this is even the most liberal scholars date Daniel to the second century B.C. So even if you didn't believe it was about Jesus, it's pretty fascinating. It's at least seeming to predict uh, the Roman Empire, which is pretty crazy. Um, and a lot of other examples. That's just one off the top of my head. But um uh, nobody's going to find that convincing unless they're already open to the possibility that there could be such a thing. So what we conceive of as evidence is ultimately, and how we interpret the evidence is going to be determined by governing presuppositions. And so that's why I think it is useful to do this kind of a dialogue and talk about coherentism ultimately at, at the, the ground most fun, fundamental level. So that's why I don't typically just start going to to prophecies is because nobody's going to find a prophecy convincing. And this fact, and this even comes up in the Gospels. There's a story where, you know, when Jesus is telling the parable of uh, the rich man and Lazarus, uh, when when they're in Hades and the, the uh, rich man says, uh, send, let me go back and talk to my brothers and then they'll believe because somebody rose from the dead. And Jesus makes the, the quip that they won't believe even if somebody rises from the dead. And he says that they have Moses and the prophets, and if people aren't interested to see if those prophecies are valid, they're not going to believe if somebody rises from the dead, because what we experience in the, the natural world is determined by governing presupposition. So that's why I don't uh, immediately just start appealing to to prophecies. Yeah, prophecy is um, a big thing to dig in on, so I'm, I'm not going to go there other than I was going to object to something you said, and then I realized it was technically correct, even though I think there's an implication that's not, which is nobody's going to believe prophecy unless they're open to the possibility of it. Uh, well, the, sure, I, I would argue that's true, or at least you would have to then convince them of the possibility of it, and then they would accept. But also, there are people who are perfectly open to the possibility of it who aren't going to be convinced by whatever prophecy that you present in the same way right. that you, you find Daniel 9 uh, particularly impressive. There are people who find stuff from Edgar Casey or Nostradamus particularly impressive, and right. I don't. And it's not because I'm closed to the possibility. Uh, it's, I be, I, I'm open to the possibility as soon as somebody demonstrates that they can actually do it, which is why the J-Ref had the million-dollar prize for so long. And still does, but I mean, nobody won it. 
Slav K five uh, Matt. Matt, why do clown masses happen and what is their justification? I don't think Matt cares about clown masses, but he can answer that if he wants to. I don't know. I don't think I know what clown masses are. <laughs> uh, so basically, since Vatican II and the Roman Catholic Church, there's been a lot of liturgical abuse, and sometimes they do divine. They do they do mass and they have clowns. People dress. Oh, up. oh yeah. I have I have no clue. Uh, I I seem to vaguely recall something like this, but yeah, that's not a question for me. All right, I think that's uh, where we're going to end it. Um, we took a lot of super chats, and thanks again to Matt for coming on. Uh, again, his link is in the bio. Anything you want to say in pa uh, in parting, Matt? No, I've I've said enough. If you're interested in stuff that I do, stop by Patreon.com/slash Atheist Debates or watch the Atheist Experience live, or I don't know, MattDeloney.com still up, but I don't think I haven't updated the calendar or any of that stuff. If you're going to be a Dragon Con, look around. I know there's ninety thousand people there, but look around and say hi if you see me. All right. Thank you, everybody. Hester, you got any final parting words for us or alternate current radio? No, thanks, gentlemen. Uh, great, great discussion. Really appreciated it. Thanks for letting me uh, do the timekeeper on it. And uh, we'll uh, look forward to watching it on the replay. This was a really good time. I hope you guys do it again. And uh, thanks again for having me.